uh, basically fuses two bro broadcast operations. Um, so you can write rules like this and immediately apply it on uh, the symbolic expressions that you just created. Um, and here's an example. Here I'm creating a rule uh, for the matrix chain multiply optimization. And then um, here the input is x times y times d. And x times y is 10 by 10. Uh, but it's ultimately just two matrix vector multiplies. Um, so if you apply the rule here, you get back a new expression, uh, which um, which shows that it's uh, it's first doing the matrix vector multiply here, and then doing the matrix vector multiply on the resulting vector. So I will uh, talk about this this notation of array op in the next slide. Um, um, yeah. So if you if you uh, enable this uh, flag, uh, this flag um, called show array op from Symbolics, uh, every time you would perform an array operation, you get back uh, a notation. Let me check again. Um, uh, which, which says what is the loop going on inside, basically. So this is a variation on uh, what many people call the Einstein summation notation, uh, which basically means that uh, for every i, um, this is how you compute it, right? So it's saying that uh, for every i, take x i comma k and multiply it with y comma k. And since k does not appear on the left-hand side, this also means that uh, the dimension where k is used must be reduced over. And by default, we reduce over it with the plus operation. So this becomes a matrix vector multiply. Um, in the second example, we have uh, um, J in the left-hand side, but not I. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. This was supposed to be prod. So here, I, uh, I, I want to use a different reduce function, uh, which is not plus, right? So um, that's also allowed. Yeah, you can have a star as the reduce operation. So in this case, it's doing a product over the first dimension. Um, and that's the array of you get. And yeah, finally, you can nest these things. So for example, this adjoint is written as uh, 1 comma i equals uh, y of y, y of i, uh, which basically turns a, uh, column, a column vector into a row vector. and then it's doing a couple of broadcasts. Um, uh, and broadcast is, in this case, it's just a, um, it's all, yeah, in, in this case, it's just um, um, doing two loops, right? Um, yeah, so as you can see, it, it encodes both the high level operation where, and uh, this loop formulation of the operations that we are doing. And it turns out we can represent um, most of Julia's um, standard array uh, library using uh, this notation. So for example, broadcast reduce over any dimension um, as some of the linear algebra up to blast uh, two or, or, or like even blast three where except the solve operations can be represented in this way. Um, and it also ha has the feature to represent um, indexing. So slicing arrays can also be represented using this array op notation. Uh, so when you do a get index, this is what it internally represents. Uh, here I have a slice of x being up, uh, broadcasted with the sign function. So you can see the internal array op is basically it's an identity uh, operation, but with the index set subset from the entire index set. Um, yeah, so why do we need this tensor notation? It seems like a extra level of complication, but uh, it turns out it makes a lot of things very easy. Uh, so first of all, it encodes the loops. This means we can generate the loops when we want to compile it down to Julia code. Um, secondly, um, it, it allows
Apologies, Shashi appears to have frozen in the stream. He'll be back shortly. And we lost him completely. All right, he should be back. Hi, Shashi. Hi. You, you got kicked out again? Yeah. Uh, so um, I do you know where uh, if you were seeing the slide? Yeah, I can see the slide. No, but uh, was this the slide that was before? Yeah, um, you were you were explaining um, about you hadn't gotten to talking about differentiation or anything. But... Okay, cool. Yeah, so I was. I was just explaining about Get Index, I guess. Um, OK, yeah, so I'll just continue from here. So I was uh, saying that um, even Get Index can be represented using this notation, and we do it in symbolics. Um, so in this case, x there is a slice of x here, and the internal loop contains the uh, ranges of the indices. And this, this also makes it easy to uh, have shape propagation and checking going on at all times. Um, okay. okay, so why do we need this tensor notation? It looks like uh, an extra layer of complication, but it turns out it makes a lot of things easier. First of all, we have the loops encoded in this notation, so we can generate the loops uh, in Julia when we need to compile a certain operation. Um, secondly, shape propagation just becomes centralized, so we don't have to do it for every single operation uh, that is there in the standard library. So we just do it for um, arrays in general. Uh, and yeah, differentiation uh, becomes possible. We just have to differentiate the internal um, expressions. And finally, it also makes it possible for us to um, go back and compute a specific element of, a, um, of the result of an array operation, right? So here I have a x broadcast over x times y, and I'm indexing the first element. So if you do this in the REPL, you just get this uh, lazy uh, expression. And then if you call symbolics.scalarize, it's going to go back and uh, take the tensor notation and start applying the indices that you want starting from one, right? And then it's going to say that um, the result of the first element here is going to be uh, at the dot product of y with the first row of x and x of that, right? So this becomes possible with the tensor notation. Um, but, uh, yeah, so and then we can compile these uh, expressions to Julia code uh, using this two expr. There are three ways to do it. So firstly, there is two expr, which will just give a code fragment. We're using the same names um, for how to do this. And then there's in place expr, which uh, gives a, a for loop. And you also need to give like an output array symbol. And uh, basically, it, it, it gives some code which fills up the output array symbol with the operation required. So in this case, it's a um, it's a matrix vector multiply. So it, it has one loop um, going over all the case and one loop go going over all the uh, i's um, and filling up each element of the output. Um, so and then finally, we have this build function, uh, which is what Marlin toolkit uses. So if you give it an array operation and then say x and y are the inputs, it just gives you back uh, um, a function which takes x and y as inputs, uh, a tuple x and y as inputs, and uh, does the operation required. Um, and in this case, it's using like the, just the high-level representation, not the loops representation. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some languages which do which are doing 
novel things in array specific um, domain specific languages. Um, so first of all, there is like JAX, which uh, mirrors the NumPy API. Uh, so it it is kind of symbolic in the sense that when you um, when you create arrays in JAX and apply operations in them, it maintains this expression tree, and then it can do um, automatic differentiation on it, and it can do um, shape propagation and checking. And the internals work mostly as if we are doing, you know, um, uh, symbolic tracing, right? as if you are running something with symbols, right? Um, but it's also just geared towards uh, machine learning. It doesn't explicitly provide symbols. Um, and then there is DEX, which is a, a functional language. Um, it's kind of like Haskell, the flavor, or ML. And um, yeah, checking it down. And it, it, it allows you to express um, for loops or comprehensions. Um, and the uh, index sets are part of the type. So which means that like the index ranges are part of the type, basically. And every time some operation happens, the index sets become, um, yeah, index sets are uh, type checked in, in a sense. Um, but this language does not have uh, metaprogramming, which means uh, you can't take the expressions themselves and transform it in the language. Um, uh, so, but if you think about it, since symbolics um, can compile down to Julia code, it, 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 when you're doing symbolics, you are doing metaprogramming um, in some sense. And it's like the most um, user-friendly form of metaprogramming, where there's the, you're manipulating these expressions with like a rich library of uh, things around it. Um, yeah, and there's halide, which is mostly geared towards parallelism. I think I'm running out of time. So, um, uh, par parallelism of for loops and. Ashi, you yeah. can go um, for five more minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. Strict there. So. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so, yeah, again, halide is uh, all the features have to be built into the language. Um, but. Uh, I think symbolic arrays let you uh, allow you to have much more flexibility in that sense. Um, so, in summaries, uh, array symbolics have been around for a while, but like the the attitude towards it from other CAS, uh, other computer algebra systems have been like, you know, this is just another type of symbol. Um, but in symbolics, we take it a step further and. We have multiple encodings, and in the sense, we, we also maintain like the for loop representation of an ER array operation, which allows us to do compilation and optimizations. Um, um, and um, yeah, it, this is super important for the SIML ecosystem because that's like compiling symbolics is what we care about the most. Um, yeah, and it becomes a metaprogramming tool in the end. Um, yeah, so things we are working on in the future uh, includes uh, loop uh, uh, generating the code uh, to be very efficient uh, using loop vectorization and using crystal rod in general. Uh, the differentiation of array operations is coming, and we're working on stencils and. Uh, I have this project to do like XLA style optimization of flux models. So if anybody here is interested in doing that, then uh, please uh, talk to me uh, after the talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Yingbo, Chris, and Alan uh, for helping me work on this. Uh, Yingbo has, uh, when I have questions, I always talk to Yingbo and it always clears me up, uh, clears them up. So uh, if you want to use symbolics, I hope you can uh, you know this already. You can go to juliasymbolics.org and read more about it. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you, Shashi. Um, so why not? Since we gave, said we give you five minutes, why don't we we do one question from Discord, um, and then maybe you can go take a look at the other one uh, that's on okay. there. Um, so the the first one was uh, asking about your the chain of array multiplications that you showed. 
Yeah. Um, saying, can you apply a rule that calculates the optimal array multiplication order using dynamical programming or such that uh, they didn't think the a simple greedy rule uh, works in general when you have, I guess, a bigger chain? Uh-oh, it seems like Shashi froze on us. Um, okay, so maybe we should just move on to the next talk um, since Shashi is frozen anyways. Um, so, uh, Ranjan, do you want to handle setting it up? Great. Um, okay. All right. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you Great. see my uh, presentation? I can see your presentation. So Perfect. hopefully everyone else can. Um, all right. So our next speaker is uh, Ilya Elmer, um, who is, a, I believe, a graduate student at City University of New York in computer science. Um, and has done a lot of really nice work on structural identifiability tooling in Julia and is going to give us an introduction to that. So please take it away, Ilya. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Ilya. Hi, everybody. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the Graduate uh, Center at the City University of New York. And today I will present a quick tutorial on structural identifiability solution in Julia. Um, I, uh, my research topic is uh, parameter identifiability algorithms. And um, in this talk, uh, I'll first introduce the uh, identifiability problem. Um, we'll, uh, I will present um, two uh, Julia-based solutions. Um, one of them, namely uh, structural identifiability.jl, is included in SIML framework, uh, SIML infrastructure. infrastructure. Um, uh, the other one, a structural identifiability analyzer, is um, uh, a Julia port from Maple of another uh, identifiability algorithm that's very efficient. So we'll kind of go. We'll go over uh, the differences uh, during the example section. We'll uh, I will do a quick uh, live coding demo, and then we'll uh, highlight some uh, you know, differences and uh, how one uh, package can complement another um, during the conclusion section. So what is a structural identifiability problem? And well, in general, parameter identifiability deals with situations where um, we are given an ODE model, and we would like to know whether we can determine uh, parameters of that model. And um, you know, one way to do it would be to set up an experiment, measure uh, certain variables, certain state values, and then try to manipulate the data to get the uh, value of a parameter. Um, a, a structural identifiability is a theoretical notion that can answer that question from a symbolic um, ODE system. Um, and uh, such structural identifiability is, uh, can be categorized further into global and local. So global identifiability is when a parameter's value can be determined uniquely. And uh, uh, we say a parameter is uh, locally identifiable or local identifiability case is when there are finitely many solutions um, to, uh, for, for the current parameter. If neither of those situations occurs, and maybe the parameter has infinitely many values, uh, then we say that such parameter is non-identifiable. Now, there are ways to mitigate this issue. Um, I will mention them, but I don't think I'll have enough time to kind of cover uh, in full details. Um, but we'll definitely talk about what can be done for that case. So let's consider a simple uh, example. Uh, we have a, um, the following input structure, and this structure will be preserved for either Julia package either cyan or uh, structural identifiability. So we have an ODE um, of which there could be more than one, but for this example, let's consider a single one. So we've got two parameters and one state variable, and we have an output function. Consider this something that can be measured during uh, the experimental stage. Um, and so if we were to plug this into each of the packages, cyan, structural identifiability analyzer, would tell us that the initial condition and the parameter B are globally identifiable while uh, parameter A is only local identifiable. That does make sense. I mean, measure Y at zero and you get the initial condition. A is seen with a square, so there would be uh, two values uh, that, could be, that could satisfy um, an equation for A. Um, so finally, main solutions for A and unique solution for B and X. Structural identifiability, on the other hand, will tell us that B is globally and A is locally identifiable and will not provide any information about the states. So this is the first difference that we encounter between the two packages. Um, under the hood of Cyan uh, lies uh, a Monte Carlo algorithm which accepts the ODE model and the probability of correctness. So default probability value is always 0 0.99, and of course, users can adjust it. Um, the value will affect the runtime. So the higher probability of correctness, the slower it might become. Um, and the input ODE model is transformed into a polynomial system, 
from which we first uh, extract the local identifiability information. And then from the local identifiability information in further transforms of the polynomials, we can compute uh, Grubner basis and just determine global identifiability um, report. In the structural identifiability.jl package, we've got uh, a similar st input structure. So we provide a model with outputs and the probability of correctness p. However, the process of determining identifiability is a little different where we uh, compute something called uh, input-output equations. So we only consider equations that contain inputs, input functions, output functions, and their derivatives. Uh, and then the, uh, the identifiability report is based on the coefficients from the equations, a field of coefficients. Um, now, the structural identifiability package can distinguish between single and multi-experiment identifiability, and we'll see where this is beneficial and both can be um, uh, can lead to an incorrect answer. So right now, let's move to a coding example. So I did preload a few packages, like structural identifiability and modeling toolkit, as well as some other things that we're going to use to um, visualize what's going on with uh, identifiability. So let's first create um, a simple ODE. It's, it's based on the example from the slides where there are, th there are going to be three parameters now and two states. Um, so we're going to create the array of equations. Uh, and this is, by the way, all coming from a modeling toolkit. So this is a, a modeling toolkit based format for the input value. Um, at the end of this representation, I'll also show the um, structural identifiability kind of native, a slightly different input format. Um, so let's define a modeling toolkit ODE system um, and define the array of uh, measured quantities. So these are the outputs that I talked about in the beginning. So we'll start with analyzing uh, local identifiability first. So um, if I run the assess local identifiability function and provided the measured quantities, um, so first, it's going to pre-process the ODE system, which means that it's going to convert it to the data type that's um, accepted by internals of uh, structural identifiability. Um, okay, so this is uh, done. Let's consider, let's see the result. So it tells us that A and B are local identifiable. So the output of this is a dictionary uh, from the symbols to uh, the Boolean value. C is not, a, not locally identifiable, and if it's not locally identifiable, it means that it's not going to be identifiable at all. Uh, and it does make sense. We consider the output, like we measure something that only in the ODE depends on A and B. So no information about C was provided, which is why we would not get any information about it. So let's uh, compute another identifiability um, result. This time we're going to get a full picture. So local, global, and non-identifiable altogether. So again, it starts with pre-processing, and it's going to go through the stage of local identifiability, and it begins the input-output equation computation. Um, and then um, there's a lot of internal information about what's going on with the Bronskian computation and, and, and so on. It's finally done. Um, so it tells you in about roughly nine seconds, we got the um, global identifiability result. Let's see. OK, so as before. If, let me put the equation up uh, on the screen. So we have uh, A being locally identifiable and B globally identifiable. C is not identifiable, so that result is uh, preserved. Okay, so let's consider a slightly more complicated example. So this uh, model comes from oscillatory behavior in enzymatic uh, control processes paper. Um, let's define the states, parameters, and the equations. So there are four states. And we're going to use a single output. So we're just going to measure the first uh, state. OK. Um, we'll define the ODE system. And let's assess the full identifiability. Oh, and it's already done in less than a second. Um, uh, if we display the result, we see that um, almost everything is globally identifiable. I believe B, um, C, and sigma are uh, global identifiable. Beta and delta are local. And alpha and gamma are, are non identifiable. Now, I want to focus on these for a few, uh, for a couple of minutes just to visualize what this means. So let's give it, um, let's actually solve the ODE. Uh, so let's provide some initial conditions. Uh, let's give it a time span and some parameter values. And let's define the ODE problem that we're going to solve and plot. So the idea is to kind of illustrate what we're going to do is we're going to plot the solution for two collections, for two sets of values. So as you can see, I'm going to alter. Uh, alpha and gamma, which I remember, they're not identifiable. So um, we should be able to 
well, actually, we shouldn't be able to see anything changed uh, on the, on the um, on the picture on the plot. So let's visualize what's going to happen, um, and I will, in the meantime, um, alter the parameters. So. <clears throat> For now, it's just going to plot a single solution. And, and remember that we're plotting the thing that we're measuring. Um, otherwise, that wouldn't necessarily make sense. Um, OK, so here's okay, here's a function. Um, looks like um, you know, kind of decreases real fast. Very nice. Let's create a new um, ODE problem with changed values of parameters. And let's plot that as well. Um, oh. Let's see. Oh, okay. As you can see, even though I changed the parameter values, the curves are almost identical. I mean, they're probably even exactly identical. So the parameters are unidentifiable, and so we wouldn't be able to tell that from the um, um, ODE. Now, let's also uh, show another feature of structural identifiability where we can check a parameter a function of parameters for identifiability. In this case, I'm going to ask, well, is alpha plus gamma or alpha plus g identifiable? If I run this, um, it does the check, and the result is displayed here in the terminal. It tells me that, no, it's actually not identifiable. Um, so uh, the reason why this might be of use to check a function of parameters is because if parameters, some parameters may not be identifiable, there may be a function that, that, that can be identified. Um, OK, so now let's consider an example where we use the structural identifiability um, native kind of input. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit to show the full OEE. Um, so it does kind of look like what you would expect to be written on paper. Uh, I'm going to close the uh, plots here. Um, right, so if I call this, it's going to define ODE, give you a quick summary of states, parameters, and output functions. Um, and if I call it assess identifiability on that, I see a warning saying that the result that it provides, and let me display the result, might be only valid for a multiple experiment case. Um, well, the result that it tells me is K1 is globally identifiable, so is K2 and EB. As a quick note, let's check this um, identifiability for these two functions. And this time, um, we didn't see any warnings. Uh, and locally, these functions are nicely identifiable. So it's another example of where uh, you can identify two functions of parameters. Now let's go ahead and um, follow the warning. So the warning told us to actually use Cyan to uh, check identifiability of the set model. Cyan is the second package that I mentioned in uh, my uh, slides that also is very well integrated with a modeling toolkit. Uh, one notable difference for now is that we still have to define um, outputs in the definition of variables, um, but we are working to make it more compatible with um, or kind of more similar to how uh, structural identifiability does it, where you just provide a separate array of equations. Um, so let's define the equation set, create the system, and call the main function of cyan called identifiability ODE. Um, okay. All right. So um, let me actually display the result. Um, did I not? OK, no, I think now it works. Um, OK, so yeah, um, it starts with a similar process of you know, pre-processing and converting the input from the model toolkit format to the uh, appropriate data type. It does start with the local identifiability report and then proceeds to the global identification report. And um, as you can see, so before, structural identifiability told us that these three were global identifiable. But that was only valid for when you perform more than one experiment. It turns out that if you perform a single experiment, you only get identifiability uh, local, but not global. So let's try to mitigate this. So I'm going to define this again. And what I will do is I will generate a replica. In fact, I'm going to consider the input to be two ODEs, but with different initial conditions. So if I do that, and um, Okay, so the replicas are generated. I'm going to call my function again. However, I will uh, specify the parameters um, of the model without initial conditions. Well, because if we did check initial conditions, that would be two separate sets, and maybe it would be um, 
not as interested and as interesting as um, some other things that we're going to see. So now, after performing two experiments, so two copies of the input model, we get the same identifiability result um, as structural identifiability. So that kind of concludes the slide, uh, sorry, the live uh, coding section. And um, to conclude, um, we saw two available solutions for parameter identifiability in ODE models. There isn't a one framework that would solve everything. So these kind of complement one another. Um, some may be appropriate for more output functions. Uh, some would be uh, faster when there are fewer outputs and, and more equations, more ODEs. Um, but both can handle quite large systems. We've got a lot of work in, uh, planned for in enhancement of the underlying um, like Gerbner basis computations and integration with more uh, SIML uh, uh, frameworks. Um, we also currently have a Maple-based solution on the web that com combines these algorithms and some more uh, uh, in extensions. And we're also building a Julia web-based solution for the, um, yeah, for the web. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much to the organizers. And um, here are some references that I used. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very nice talk. Um, so I think we've got a little time for some questions since you started late. Um, so there were a couple on Discord. So the, the first one was asking, um, uh, can you use this with, in combination with a Turing.jl model that you know involves ODEs? Right. Um, I don't think that right now it would be compatible, but it's something certainly we would uh, consider looking into. Um, there, yeah. So it's not right now to be like a, to give a short answer. Not right now, but um, that certainly would be interesting to um, look into more how to make them compatible with uh, ODEs that maybe um, coming from Turing uh, at GL. Um, one of the uh, other Discord questions was asking if you could say a little more about the maybe the, the notion or the differences between global and local structure, structural identifiability. Um, yeah. So, so <clears throat> when, um, let me actually maybe con consider this example. So uh, like the, the biggest difference in between local and global is that um, when you, if you were to solve this equation, um, you would actually like maybe if you, even if you don't have the value of b, right? If you have x dot equals a squared uh, times x, if you solve it, you can find the value of parameter a, um, but uh, because a is squared in the ODE, you will be able to identify a squared uniquely, but not um, the value of a itself, right? Because whatever a squared might be equal to, maybe actually let me. Uh, write it down. So if you have, if you identify a squared to be something, then a will have plus minus that value, right? Well, to a square root of something. So there are two values. However, a squared is identified uniquely. So that would be global identifiability when there's one solution. And um, a local identifiable parameter is, I have more than one, but finitely many solutions. So I, I hope that clarifies um, the question. I hope it did. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we got one from the from YouTube. Uh, at least I think that's the source uh, asking: uh, Can you do identifiability of initial conditions? Yes. So uh, initial conditions are identified by Cyan. Um, so Cyan actually considers the output functions themselves, and, and the initial conditions will come from from here. Uh, structural identifiability doesn't check for uh, initial conditions because the underlying um, equations that it considers our input output equation. So they, they only contain y's. And if um, I don't have an example with an input function right now, but if there was an input function, well, maybe b is an input function, right? So there wouldn't be any state left basically in the during the process of identifiability uh, computation with um, structural identifiability. So to answer shortly, cyan can identify initial conditions. Um, structural identifiability cannot. And the difference is because of the underlying algorithm. Uh, okay, actually, we just got another in. Um, so can can the parameters be an array? And if so, uh, is identifiability the same for all elements? So I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe you, you know exactly what that's asking. But. Um, so if, right, so I'm, uh, if, I, if I understand the question correctly, let's say you would like to define a parameter uh, Q that would go from one to some number. That might Currently, be this type of symbolic definition does is not supported 
uh, but we have a, we kind of we're working on supporting this uh, and resolving the issue. Um, so if that is what you mean by a parameter array, then it's not supported right now, um, but it will certainly be supported in the future. We'll work on that. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, I, think I actually had a one question myself, which is, um, I don't know the kind of relevant theory or algorithms in this area, but is there much work uh, in kind of known good methods if you have stochastic problems like SDEs, for example, instead of ODEs or uh, jump processes, which is what I simulate a lot? Right. So um, I don't really work with stochastic differential equations. I, I don't think I can answer the question. I believe there are works. Um, but I don't think I would be, um, I don't think I know enough of, of I'm sure. not familiar too well with them uh, to kind of give a solid answer. Um, but that's uh, definitely worth looking into. I believe there are, uh, there is research done, but um, I just personally don't work with stochastic sure. differential equations. Okay, great. Well, then I, um, I guess we'll stop there. It's probably, it's about time to start our next talk. And so thank you again for a really nice talk. Thank you very much. So, all right. And, uh, our last speaker of this session is uh, Utkarsh. Um, I, I, I apologize if I hope I got your name right, um, who uh, is going to tell us about parallel extrapolation methods. And I'll let you get going so we can kind of try to stay on time. So, Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Utkarsh. So I'm currently a senior at IIT Kanpur. And I've been majoring in two very different fields, electric and chemical. And I've been uh, coming to MIT and working with Julia Lab. So yeah. So I believe like, let us, you know, kind of start introducing like what are basically extrapolation methods. So like, as, like, as the name say, it kind of extrapolates the solution. So, so I just, you know, have this snippet from the here, like, which, which basically, you know, explains all the things very detailed in, in that. So I'll just briefly go through it. Uh, so what extrapolation method does is basically it kind of compute the corresponding step. Uh, by basically, you know, choosing a uh, particular subsequence, and as you can see that it has a, it uh, basically you know extra, extrapolates to the t i comma one, and which basically kind of eliminates the as many terms that which are possible in the S asymptotic expansion by com computing the interpolation poly polynomial, and finally, uh, so basically it helps us to you know reach higher orders, and it is also a variable step method as well, so it kind of operates in both domains. And like, so these methods are now part of the ordinary DFQ uh, system. So it supports all of the, all of the, all of the functionalities that we have, the linear solve, the threading, multi-threading, as well as some, some area, which I would be going to discuss, like, which was uh, kind of, you know, explained in the here. And uh, so as you can see that these are some other two methods, like uh, with one of them is explicit, like, which don't, uh, which, uh, which are basically use for non-stiff problems. So these are some of the methods that we have, and uh, uh, and another methods are the implicit methods. So that is that would be kind of my focus for this talk, and like like we kind of you know identified a domain for domain for these problems, and uh, yeah, so they are kind they're performing well. But yeah, the work is in progress, and yeah, it could get better. And uh, coming to that, so I'll basically jump right into it. Like uh, the OD code is everything written in the or if you could jail, you can check it out. And uh, and every implementation that is there, but let me, you know, come to that, like how we are parallelizing them. So we basically choose a step number sequence, like as I had already told that we need to, you know, have smaller step sizes. So that smaller step size extrapolates to the bigger step size that we are taking at that point. Then basically this, uh, then this computation of t k comma one requires two k sequential function evaluations. So this is this kind of a text that I have, uh, this is basically kind of error hypothesized. And if we are using MIMD processors, multiple input, multiple data, then this kind of this serial evaluation can be, you know, uh, processed into K processor and uh, which will basically generate the numerical approximation TKK. And uh, after that, and so basically this kind of parallelizes our code and the, the extrapolation that we are kind of the final time time step that we are for kind of you know uh, exposes the multi threading and parallelism apart from apart from the LU factorization that we would have in the implicit implicit methods so, that, so yeah that being that and uh, yeah i have just you know put a uh, put uh, put down some code snippet as well so as you can see that we are uh, so we are calling 
we are calling the jacobian 2w on on the on a particular thread and which basically uh, performs a linear solve and uh, and this linear solve kind this linear solve kind of you know computes the computes the step at at that point and then it basically uh, then then this then whole collection of this uh, extra extrapolated variables takes place and we finally uh, reach to the uh, reach to the kind of approx approx approximation of the method that we are trying to have so so what is this what is so special about like i mean uh, this is like kind of already been uh, you know discussed in books and as well as these methods are quite popular so what happen is that when we are using large set of ods so in case of uh, in a stiff ods let me be particular to that so we will require a, a we will require a lu factorization that o n cube solve and what won't happen is that so this is being done by blas so blas multi threading is not so efficient uh, in like let us say like this is kind of a heuristic in uh, less than 100 ods so this would require multiple lu factorization that scales like o n cube so we know that the inverse is kind of you know goes in o n cube so there would be uh, let us say that there would be there would be a cut off that point where it's long, no longer a good idea i mean there is a kind, as we know there is a overhead in this uh, parallelism that we have so and also the jacobian is too small to parallelize in the lu factorization effectively so it becomes a sealer solver for sufficiently small problems so in that case like uh, rodas method would be more serially efficient but these methods could expose parallelism to be faster on multi core machines at that point and uh, so that's why our implicit uh, implicit extrapolation methods come into place and we know that uh, blas is already multi threading efficiently so a serial method is already using its all cores and coming to that like as i have already uh, already men mentioned this be, uh, this is basically it, it is important in uh, quantitative system ph pharmacology models because these applications use gradient based optimization on stiff systems of size such that the optimization nature requires the parameter choices to be solved serially so thus parallelism needs to be exposed from the solver that's why these extrapolation methods kind of you know work in that in that qsp models domain and we need to you know also take care about the size that we have so yeah coming to that so now basically it's mostly benchmarks now and i'll maybe kind of walk through the benchmarks that we have so this is a rober problem let me come to that first so the rober problem is uh, is a stiff problem and it, it is composed of three ods so this is generally so this benchmark was you know uh, to, took upon uh, taken upon on high tolerances and as you can see that uh, there is implicit error warrant extrapolation method so this is basically a midpoint uh, midpoint method which is the the e, e small step size is using is being computed by the midpoint rule and uh, and uh, this is kind of an and this is implicit so basically as you can see that it is kind of you know uh, uh, kind of performing well and uh, for some tolerances with the roda so which is the best which is the best solver that uh, that the rope problem has so and even even you can see as implicit implicit euler extrapolation so that is that kind of also performs well but uh, as you can see that we have this kind of suite of solvers so that can be you know uh, tailored ac according to your problem that we have how much stiff it is and etc coming to that so this is a qsp model that i would be going to discuss in the next slide so as you can see that this is was computed on low transfer and you can see that this completely beats the other solvers that are in this domain uh, even the rosenbrock and the tr bdf which works in the in, in this um, in this method so so this is the kind of the uh, which basically explains my point like this is the kind of the domain of this uh, methods like and, and where the where the users can benefit from them and uh, coming to that so basically here are also implemented this in the fortran as well so these are the sodex and the sodex method so basically i have i have included a link here so you can check them out so we had a, we have we have good fortran wrappers so od interface and od interface dfq as well so that is uh, that is so that is being benchmark here as you can see that clearly beats the already existing fortran solvers is which kind of you know stands the testimonial to the ordinary dfq solvers that we have like the benchmarks are pretty amazing and you can check them in sci sci benchmark as well so it kind of amounts to the uh, five five times performance gain so yeah and so it is uh, pretty good according to that 
so i'll now you know talk about the brush letter problem so basically it's it's kind of a pde which is being semi discretized to generate an ode and we can you know we can you know generate generate uh, in our own sense like uh, that could be you know that discretization is the one to us and that you know kind of scales that so that problem so that problem size kind of scale as n square so i took this i took this example as well so this is uh, this is stiff so basically demonstrate that the as you can see it, it is near the 100 range so 120 od is pretty near that range and what is happening is that uh, the i mean the threaded versions are being uh, uh, are performing very uh, are performing much better than the unthreaded ones so that kind of gives us a 40 to 50 perform 40% to 50 performance gain and uh, and uh, coming to that uh, I mentioned polyester thread there, so yeah. So basically, polyester threads are the cheap threading unit which is being provided by Julia Sim, so uh, courtesy of Dr. Chris Elrod. So that has been incorporated into them. So the overhead, uh, overhead basically in this thread multi-threading is kind of reduced now. So as you can see that uh, comparing uh, comparing the polyester threads over the threaded, so you can use polyester polyester threads for this use case as well. So that is kind of an API that we have. And also we uh, also coming to the API, we also support uh, sequence step, uh, uh, sequence step, maximum order, minimum order. So these orders can go to very higher orders, like around 15 orders, and the extra uh, and and the uh, and basically we can also select the sequences which are the harmonic, romber, bullish, like, like every. So what has been you know given given by the book, so it supports and it can be you know uh, tuned as per your problem. So that is the kind of the aim of providing a comprehensive API to that. And uh, yeah, so yeah. And so basically I also tested with this, uh, another method as what the Euler very centric method. So one of one guy, uh, I guess he did his thesis in the very centric exp extrapolation kind of implemented some of the met explicit methods. So uh, my job was to, you know, uh, translate them into implicit methods and we are using very centric ex extra extrapolation in it. So it performs similar to this, uh, similar to the hair and Warner method that basically which uses the midpoint method and this uses the Euler method. And this kind of gives the performance improvement in it. And coming to the QSV model that I was talking about. So basically uh, with the help of modeling toolkit and systems, uh, SBML toolkit.jl. So I was able to, you know, uh, Parse model, which is basically a QSV model. This model describes and compares two models on the EGFR signaling. So that is kind of a protein receptor thing. So I, I am not specializing to that, but yeah. I, uh, so it it kind of has around 109 ODs, so which basically falls into a domain. And as you can see that uh, it it supports all the things in module two, which is the structure simplify. So that is the uh, I mean the, uh, that is so that is the that is the advantage of building into the SIML ecosystem. And uh, you can see that it has a it has a very significant 80 80 percent performance increase with multi-threading. So you can get so and that uh, that application kind of depends on the number of uh, number of core as well. So like how much uh, so if you have a higher core count, you can you know get, get much more better performance. And uh, yeah, so I mean you can try these uh, you can try this method the implicit methods on the systems pharma pharmacology met, model. Yeah. So, coming to coming to like summarizing like the thoughts that I have. So every method has its pros and cons. So the pro. Let me come to the pros uh, first. So basically, this is this is good for QSV models having 80 to 100 ODs, and you, uh, that that range is kind of heuristic. Like maybe as as I demonstrated the brush polymer, it can go to even 120 ODs as well. So it leverages higher core count apart from the LE factorization that that is already being take place. So we kind of Turn it off. Uh, turn it off in the implicit method that we have. So the every so 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 that co the co the cores are being blocked by the value factorization. So it is good for highly stiff problems and precision. If you want to go for very higher order, very higher order method. So uh, so uh, this method is quite good. So you can get good accuracy and precision. So this can go up to 15. The non-threaded version, like I have also demonstrated in the rover problem as well. The non-threaded version performs. Comparable to with common stiff OD method, so that is a, I mean, yeah, it's not bad uh, that it is that it has a very trade-off in the performance. But yes, uh, if, uh, we can you know check on the models that we are building and uh, you know subsequently decide what to do. So the con is that like what I feel like the domain is quite restricted. I mean, 
uh, they are better better stiff methods available for most of the general problems like uh, like from sundial.gl there is the cvod video method which performs very well and we have an equivalent which is a better method which is the qndf in the in the uh, in the audience difficulty which is which is completely imp imp implemented in julia and there are the rodas method as well rodas 5 rodas 4 so these are i mean in speaking in general sense like it is uh, it is kind of domain restricted so this threading overhead becomes significant in less than 100 ods so you will the, the solve will be basically be not you know very good and it is overcome by so this so this uh, uh, this uh, overhead does not scale well with the problem so we are uh, when we you know go with a very high very high order problem so then it would you know uh, that performance gain would you know be substituted by that so yeah i mean and we are working on that so and uh, and it is support the nilier solve.gl new interface with uh, which iml has so we can use multiple factorization methods and the preconditions that that are being built upon on that and yeah so it's some of the work is in working progress and we are trying to get a preprint and a paper out of it yeah so acknowledgments i i would like to thank all of these people so which are which would help and then the guidance so this, this is kindly a new venture to me and yeah thank you Uh, hi, uh, very nice talk. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so uh, I guess I, I had a question. You mentioned a little bit about at the, at the end about kind of what's next. But so, you, so you, mm. your, your conclusion is that you felt these methods were kind of a little uh, a little restricted in terms of the size of systems. Yeah. Where they, yeah. So so um, do you have ideas on how to make them more generalizable, or do you think it's better to look at some of these some of the other approaches? You know, like used by CV. Uh, yeah, I mean. i mean i think some things uh, could be done from the linear solve like that is the most expensive step because we are going to the higher orders so the linear and we are extrapolating to uh, so higher order so that linear solve would grow grow as 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 per that so maybe some if we use some uh, techniques some some tricks in the linear solve so that could be improved but yes i i mean yeah that is kind but uh, like what analysis we had so that is kind of uh, restricted to this domain okay Um well I think that's about it uh for questions I think everybody's ready for their break uh so thank you yeah. again for the talk um and I guess we will see everyone in 10 minutes for the uh sponsor talk by Julia Computing at 1:30 Eastern Standard Time
we'll wait for one more minute before you uh, you can get started jacob um but i see you have uh you've shared your slides as well as your screen separately so uh, i'm i'm just curious whether you want to put both of those together um i don't know wh whether you're going to be switching back you know uh, between slides and and screen or oh, uh, you're muted by the way oh um now i can hear you you can hear me now yep okay yeah i'm going to switch so uh go through a couple slides and switch back to my screen okay uh would you uh, should i just add your um should i add this picture to the the stream instead or should i have this instead? let's let's start with the slides and okay then, um, um when i kind of jump into the live demo i'll uh, i'll use the other screen yeah, for sure. Just just let me know, and I'll and I'll switch it. Absolutely. All right. I think we've uh, it's one thirty, so let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Jacob Vavaka from Julia Computing, and he's going to be telling us about uh, Julia Sim. Julia Computing is the sponsor of SciMelcon as well, and we thank we thank them for their sponsorship. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And today. Uh, the name of this talk is Democratizing Semineural ODEs. What I want to talk about is how Julia Computing is bringing a platform in Julia Sim uh, in order to bring uh, a lot of the advancements to many different areas, many different fields, many different teams that it previously wouldn't have been uh, capable. So with that, I'll get started. And um, as we know, the Julia community is growing rapidly. It's finding its way more and more into machine learning uh, in different industries. And Julia Computing is built on top of a foundation of Julia Hub, which is an enterprise compute platform uh, for distributed compute. It's embarrassingly parallel, it's cost effective, um, and it is all designed around uh, reproducibility and optimized for Julia development in particular. And so, the, uh, the flagship, the, the foundation of, of Julia Computing is Julia Hub. And on top of Julia Hub, we have many different tools for different industries. So uh, we are gonna be talking about Julia Sim for physical simulations, um, but there are currently other offerings for uh, pharma simulation, for circuit simulation. Um, there's certainly more to come in the future, but today we're gonna take a look at Julia Sim in particular. And to start, uh, we're just gonna kind of walk through what you might expect if you are in modeling, uh, especially within industry. Um, engineers are going to, in, they're going to incorporate modeling into their design process by, uh, by leveraging HPC, leveraging compute, and uh, you know, modeling the problems. They're gonna take these outputs, analyze them, and feed them back into the design. So. When this works well, you have data-driven decisions that are driving your design forward. And this works really well when you can experiment quickly and, and constantly iterate. The big challenge here is that many industries have, they're held back in certain places where they're dealing with long running models and accelerating that isn't always easy. So. Just because you have more compute available doesn't mean that you're automatically going to be able to get that speed up. And uh, it's doable, but it's it's time, it's effort. Um, you're always also going to want to make sure that your model is uh, still got the fidelity that you're happy with. And so, what we're looking at here is an answer to this problem, this challenge of pushing industry industrial modeling forward, um, because we want engineers to have that freedom to experiment, to ask questions that maybe weren't feasible to ask before and, and uh, see what designs come out. And we believe that by enabling this, by, by giving engineers better tools, we're gonna wind up with better designs. And so this introduces the concept of uh, a semi-neural ODE or a surrogate, uh, also sometimes called digital twins. And this is, um, I'm gonna, talk through this at a high level. This isn't meant at all to be uh, your, um, your, your in-depth explanation, but this is kind of a crash course just on what to expect because um, later on we are gonna be kind of uh, fine tuning uh, some of the parameters. And so I just wanted to give a visual representation of, of what's happening. 
And this is um, a representation of uh, the CTESN, the Continuous Time Echo State Network that uh, Chris, uh, Chris Rakakis, Yingbo, uh, many others at Julia Computing um, have all worked on this algorithm in order to uh, train and generate circuits. And so you can start with um, you can start with your your solutions. You have some weights going in. Um, the reservoir is something I want you to take note of. That's going to be a particular uh, uh, parameter that we're going to adjust later. And then um, in the middle, in the in the in the purple time series uh, where we integrate, that's where the continuous comes from because we're evolving this uh, differential equation over time. Um, and it's, it's all fed from these hidden states. And then at the end, uh, we take the output weights um, and have a uh, projection back to the state dimensions. So again, this is um, just kind of a crash course. Take note of, of the reservoir, take note of the input because this is, um, I'm trying to represent how uh, this mental model that you might have if you are uh, using Julia for your modeling and um, and then if you have more questions in particular about the CTESN, uh, there's there's papers and other talks out there that will that will deep dive that. And so, um, with that kind of out of the way, let's just talk about a general use case where you have a simulation that takes two hours, and two hours one time isn't so bad. But we're we're talking about an instance where this two hours explodes because you wind up having to run the simulation many, many times in order to find optimal controls. And so this, this two hour simulation must be run 1000 times in this workflow. And it's, I think it's, uh, it's very common depending on uh, what modeling that, that you're engaged in. But, um, you know, the, the exact numbers here are, what we're going to use walking forward just through this example to kind of share um, why the work that we're doing is, is important and, and what kind of platform we're trying to build to, to answer this challenge. So that two hour simulation run a thousand times. Um, in addition to one final run at the end to uh, kind of test run just to make sure that uh, everything looks good and, and you know, it's your validation run winds up being 2002 hours. And this is obviously something that we're trying to improve. So what we propose here with the solution is injecting, uh, injecting Julia Sim in the beginning of this process. And so what we want to do is we want to train a surrogate uh, first, uh, right out the gate, train a surrogate. And that's going to be done in order to get a faster model. So instead of running that two hour simulation a thousand times, we wind up with something that can run in a minute. Now, training the surrogate is something that we can kick off in parallel. And again, that's something that Julia Hub, uh, the foundation of, of Julia Sim is very, very good at. And so we can leverage Julia Hub to kick off thousands of, of simulations in parallel and really only have about four hours um, of training time in this example. Is, and, uh, and then you wind up with a one minute simulation, which after a thousand runs is about uh, just under two hours, uh, one and two thirds hour. And so what we're talking about here is yes, we've cut down time, but aside from just looking at it from pure compute, where we're looking at wall clock time, um, 2000 hours is, is days. It's, it's, you know, it's really weeks because you're not an engineer is not just going to be sitting there waiting for the next one to run. You don't always have the ability to just, make sure that they run sequentially because you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to step in different places, um, do some analysis, do some fixes. And so that 2000 hours turns into likely weeks or, or maybe a month where now when we're able to do these 1000 runs with a one minute simulation, we can take that down to just a couple hours. And so, we're still going to do a test run, a validation run at the end of it. Uh, that's our uh, our two hours on the right. But we've taken what could be weeks or months or, or, or a month 
down to a single working day. And that's the difference in, uh, in a, in a industrial setting. That's the kind of thing that can really accelerate a team. So, um, allow them to ask those questions that maybe previously they didn't have the bandwidth or the time to do because, uh, you know, their project is on a particular, uh, life cycle and, you know, they got to get their things out the door, uh, with the analysis that they're able to do. So this is what it can look like by in injecting Julius Sim at the beginning of this process, um, bursting one-time compute, getting that surrogate, that accelerated model then is going to benefit you uh, throughout every one of those 1000 runs to optimize. So that's what we're doing. And then quickly, I just want to talk about uh, where this has been done already. And uh, we have seen extraordinary speed ups for HVAC models. Um, this is a, an example of a 570x speed up on a, uh, this is a 8,000 equation HVAC, eight, excuse me, 8,000 equation HVAC system. And uh, we've scaled this up even further to 100,000 equations. So when, when we did that, we got an 80x speed up and 80 doesn't sound as good as 570 maybe, but when you take into account what the current tooling is capable of, right now the best you can hope for is, is uh, real-time compute. So if you wanted to simulate a year, it would take you a year to compute that. Now with an 80 times speed up, you can simulate a year within, within four days. So um, that is really what we're talking about, changing, you know, what's possible for uh for engineers and 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 modelers to ask and uh and then we this has also been applied to uh circuit systems as well so there's a 1200 equation circuit system that got a 274 times speed up and there's really no limit to where this can go so um we're looking to uh, apply this to as many industries as, as we can to uh you know spread these benefits and so uh what, I, what I'm going to run through really quickly is just an example of this model here that you see of a DCPM motor. And uh, it is just uh, measuring the influence of uh, armature temperature on performance. And uh, just note the model parameters on the bottom right. So we have voltage and we have load. And um, we're going to see how we can train a surrogate uh, over this model with these parameters. Um, and we're, again, we're going to be using that CTESN. Uh, algorithm. And so here, um, if we could switch back to my other screen. Perfect. All right. So from Julia Hub, we have the Julia Sim FMU accelerator application. And once you launch that up, you can connect to it. And then you're faced with a dashboard. And um, I guess let me back up just for a second. There's two entry points for this. So Let's say that um, you're you're writing this model in code. That's great. I'm going to talk about how you can reap these rewards. But if you're if you're not writing it um, in code per se, you're using a GUI tool, or maybe you're not writing it in Julia. Um, if you can generate an FMU uh, functional mockup unit, uh, which is uh, available from virtually every modeling tool, then you can take that FMU and upload it here and get an accelerated FMU in return. So I'm gonna show you how to do that by clicking new job. I'll upload an FMU. So this is a functional mock-up unit of that motor uh, model that I showed you. And then we have the ability to uh, adjust some parameters for this uh, surrogate training process. So uh, we are going to use the, uh, the algorithm that I shared with you. And then remember that reservoir so that's the number of, of hidden nodes in here. So we can adjust this to uh, how many we think is gonna, is gonna be appropriate for our model, um, the number of simulations that you wanna run. You can tell it uh, the time span to run over from beginning to end and the step. And then you can also enter the parameter space. Now, instead of doing this manually, I'm just gonna load a configuration for the sake of time and we will just take a look down here. So here are the uh, the load and the voltage parameters that we saw in that model. And 
we have a lower bound and upper bound and a sample point. So if you define these, you're going to define the parameter space that this circuit gets trained over. And once you're kind of happy with, uh, with these training inputs, if you hit start new job, then you're going to be brought back to the dashboard. You can see all your jobs. You can always come back and get the configuration that you used. Uh, you can get the report, which I'll share in a second, and then you can get that uh, accelerated FMU. So the report is something that I won't spend too much time on for the sake of time, but I do just want to point out that our team has done a phenomenal job of how to analyze these models. And uh, what you're seeing here is a really cool way to, uh, to subtract some of the noise. So you can see straight away some different colors. You can kind of zoom into where the model's doing poorly, for instance, and uh, see where you want to train this model over or where it's safe to use this model with a high, high accuracy. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to leave that there for now, uh, just in the interest of time. And then uh, the only other thing that I wanted to jump to real quick is just show that um, you have the ability to do this in code as well. So if you are modeling Julia, good news, you have all of these uh, configurations and more where uh, you can choose the reservoir size, uh, the algorithm to use, um, the number of simulations, you know, et cetera. And so this is going to be a very uh, familiar um, syntax and, and you know, the, the same benefits. Um, and so I'm kind of flying through this, but if you could switch back to the slides, I'll just finish up. So thank you. So all of this is um, showing two different ways to start with a model and just uh, Julia Simon and get back another accelerated model. So this FMU that we've accelerated can be uh, put back into existing tools for whichever, you know, whichever tools you're using in your workflow. So um, all those different tools that can import export FMUs can, can leverage these accelerated models. And then this is all made possible, again, um, because we have the ability to computationally burst on Julia Hub. And so um, that's the real benefit here is we are bringing not only the, the know-how, so you know, um, instead of requiring in-depth knowledge of the particular area that you model, as well as uh, the latest machine, turning, machine learning techniques, as well as you know, HPC infrastructure, um, this is really simplifying a lot of that. We can auto scale to however much compute that you might need for your model. Um, we can handle all the parallelization. Um, we can also put it back into a format that uh, you're currently working with. And so all of this is really the Julia Sim platform. Now I've shared with you a couple different tools in um, the FMU accelerator and the Julia Sim IDE, but, uh, this is the platform. This is kind of the vision. And um, and this is all in an effort to uh, accelerate scientific discovery. Right. So it's um, all uh, on top of all the work that has been shared here um, from the other members at Julia Computing. Um, this th this is this is the, the main goal is to uh, accelerate these discoveries in as many different industries and fields as possible. So uh, just have a minute or two left. And that's that's it for me. Well, thanks a lot, Jacob. Um, uh, I do have one question from YouTube. Um, so how do you handle the security aspects of Julia Hub and industry? It's a great question. And it's something that uh, we face every day because um, that's something I, I would say for uh, specific questions. Uh, I'd like for uh, you to reach out to um, info at juliacomputing.com or, or uh, any of our sales uh, personnel, but it's something that we've had to address on many fronts because of our existing partnerships and, and, and clients, right? So uh, we're working in um, a lot of different spaces that require uh, security, require compliance, require, uh, you know, data governance. There's there's very tight rules that we're, we're working with all the time. And so it's something that is really at the core of it, everything we do. Um, and yeah, I'd say with with specific questions, definitely reach out, and we can we can definitely answer um, what our current uh, strategy is, and and you know how we hope to improve going forward. All right, 
Thanks, Jacob. In the interest of time, I think I'll I'll close it out. We we are thankful again to Julia Computing for being a SimulCon sponsor. Um, and now I will move on to the next talk. Thank you for having me. Sandra, could you go ahead and uh, start sharing your screen, please? Mm -hmm. Okay. Looks like that you, you you can see my screen, right? Can yes. We? Yes, we can see your screen. I just <laughs> introduce you. Um, uh, now we have uh, Sandra Bregi, who's going to tell us about learning measured bifurcation diagrams with UDs. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I'm Sandor Berge from the University of Bristol, and as I said, I'm going to talk about learning measured uh, bifurcation diagram the UDE, so universal differential equations. Uh, so basically, the uh, this research I'm going to present here is mostly on using data-driven models on uh, nonlinear dynamical systems, which is linked to a project on uh, creating digital twins, which are essentially data-driven adaptable virtual counterparts for uh, real world of physical uh, systems. And what I found that universal differential equation models are especially good candidates at digital twins because they basically allow for having a physics-based core that's, uh, uh, that is, uh, they allow for incorporating some of our insight into these models, but by adding a machine learned uh, structure to, to the physics-based part, we can uh, compensate for the modeling errors and potentially reach a very high accuracy. This is all very promising. And I would like to use these models for uh, nonlinear dynamical systems, which is basically the broader area I uh, do research in. So that's uh, in my background. Uh, which uh, are essentially focused on systems uh, undergoing so-called self-excited vibrations. And uh, the main complexity with, with uh, these kind of systems that they are uh, most typically lead to varying parameter problems that uh, usually gives an additional complexity to the training procedure. And I will uh, present one specific application related to uh, to uh, an engineering-oriented uh, field, uh, aerostatic flutter, for which I uh, um, carried out a few numerical simulations, but I also uh, trained some mod trained the models on experimental data. Okay, but before that, I just would like to give a short introduction on what nonlinear systems actually are and what are the problems I'm uh, interested in. So basically, nonlinear dynamical systems uh, can be considered uh, as differential equations in the following form. Like we have a derivative of a state variable equal to some nonlinear function of the state variable and some system parameters. I'm considering uh, here or ordinary differential equations, but uh, one can also uh, um, take into account or, or study uh, more complex or more exotic type of differential equations. And the equations can be either autonomous or non-autonomous if we have an explicit time dependence in the equations. The important point is that in the focus of my investigations are uh, systems which have periodic solutions. And one uh, very common example is the Hopf bifurcation, which is a feature in autonomous differential equations. And basically, these two bifurcation diagrams in the bottom of my slide show the uh, typical characteristics of uh, the two basic cases of, of the whole bifurcation, the supercritical and the subcritical one. So essentially, in, in bifurcation diagrams, we typically show the steady state solutions of the system with uh, information about their stability. So in, in this case, I highlighted uh, the stable and unstable solution with different colors. So for example, what happens here that in the supercritical case, in the horizontal axis, I'm showing a chosen parameter, which is referred to as a bifurcation parameter, whereas in the vertical axis, 
in case of um, periodic solutions, it's typical to show some sort of a norm uh, related to the vibration amplitude. So basically here, in the horizontal axis, we have equilibria, which uh, uh, loses its stability at a certain uh, value of the parameter lambda. And what happens here at the Hopf bifurcation that at the stability boundary, there is a stable branch of periodic solutions emerging from, uh, from, from this point. And then this is the supercritical Hopf bifurcation. Whereas in the case of the subcritical bifurcation, a similar thing happens, but in this case, the uh, branch of uh, periodic solutions is an unstable branch. And, but uh, what um, very commonly happens that later on, uh, this unstable branch uh, undergoes a so-called saddle node bifurcation and becomes uh, stable again. And um, so basically the reason I like these diagrams and why these tell us often more information than like a simple numerical simulation would tell is uh, because using essentially the information of the steady state solutions and their stability, we can also infer what the transient of the system would look like. And um, starting with different initial conditions from different regions of the phase uh, space of the system as these uh, arrows basically indicate, we can tell where the, where the solution would converge to. And from this point of view, probably the most uh, interesting region is this one in the case of the subcritical bifurcation, when uh, we have a so-called bistable parameter region where we have uh, a, a coexisting stable equilibrium and a stable large amplitude solution. And then basically the initial condition is going to decide whether we will see uh, the equilibrium or a large amplitude oscillation in the long uh, in the longer term or in, in, in um, or as steady state behavior, which are obviously two <coughs> entirely different uh, type of behavior. Now, uh, the important thing is that in, in this case, the unstable periodic solutions play an important role because they essentially are attached to the boundary between the um, uh, domains of attraction of the two stable solutions. So that's why it's actually also important to characterize this, which uh, can be a bit challenging because this solution never directly appears in experiments since they are unstable, but we have a control-based uh, technique to trace them. So it's actually possible to uh, get information of them in, in, in measurements. So as I mentioned earlier, and, and uh, I hope that uh, I could make this a little bit more clear why these are actually varying parameter problems. And on the other hand, uh, these systems are relevant in several engineering systems. I just uh, want a few examples. I hope the video is going to start. One is uh, the example I'm going to show some numerical results of is aeroelastic flutter, which is basically the self-excited vibrations of aerofoils in airstream. The other one is another area which uh, I did a lot of uh, research in is wheel shimmy, which is basically the self-excited vibration of uh, rubber tires. Now, as you can see, these uh, vibrations are relevant because they can either cause well, well, um, some mild discomfort, but in, in some cases, if 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 you are unlucky, then they may even lead to to accidents, which is which is obviously dangerous. So we would like to avoid them. Okay. So um, after this introduction, I I would like to move on and introduce uh, the modeling concept I have uh, for these types of systems. So my assumption is that uh, we have an ob an, an experiment or a system we are observing. Um, which has these kind of periodic solutions. So for example, a subcritical Hopf bifurcation, as you can see uh, the, in, in this example uh, with the bifurcation diagram. <clears throat> and usually the, the case is uh, with an engineering system that one already has some sort of a knowledge or insight into how the system actually works. Therefore, it's usually possible to uh, come up with a good physics-based model 
which at least in a qualitative sense describes how the system behaves. But usually the case is that uh, that model is, is, is never 100% accurate. So there is, all, there is always going to be some error due to the uh, neglections and simplifications one has to make during the modeling procedure when compared to measurement data. So that's why um, I'm adding a universal approximator to the physics-based part and using a universal differential equation model to reach uh, a higher level of quantitative uh, accuracy when compared to measurement data. So uh, if we take a look at what uh, our model looks like in terms of equations, then uh, from the point of view of an experiment, it, uh, at least to me, it makes sense to uh, divide the system to an accessible and the hidden part. Basically, the accessible part, meaning all the state variables and, and, and everything about the system, which we can have, um, uh, which we can measure. And, uh, but as I said um, earlier, there, there are always going to be some neglections. So it's, it's fairly safe to assume that there is always going to be a hidden uh, part of the dynamics, which we cannot model. So essentially what we do, uh, is that um, I consider a physics-based model for the accessible part and try to fine-tune it to make it as good as possible and then add a uh, machine-learnable machine learnable structure to compensate for the error between the measurement data and the uh, smaller order physics-based model. So basically, the two types of uh, machine learned structures I'm considering for this problem is neural networks, for which I use the DFEQ flux package in Julia. So in this case, basically, the model error and the objective function is calculated from uh, um, the error in the predicted trajectories compared to the measured ones, whereas in the other case, when I consider Gaussian processes, it was a little bit different because in this case, uh, the model uh, was fitted directly to the right-hand side of the differential equations, which means I had to use acceleration data. On the other hand, Gaussian processes were uh, more useful in the cases when there was some noise in the system because they are essentially um, um, have a, a natural way of considering process noise. Um, process noise in the model. Okay, so uh, in the following slides, I just would like to going to present uh, my uh, results on the uh, model of elastic flutter, starting with the numerical simulations. So in this case, I consider the two plus one degrees of freedom model of flutter um, as uh, the underlying model of an experiment or the ground truth, if you would like. Um, where basically um, the two physical degrees of freedom of this aerofoil here, aerofoil here, the heave and the pitch motion uh, was considered as the accessible part of the model, whereas the model had a non-physical uh, degree of freedom related to the aerodynamic effects, which are considered as the hidden uh, part of the model. So basically what I did is to um, create a two degrees of freedom physics-based model using just the accessible part, the heave and the pitch motion, and added a machine learned structure to compensate uh, for the model error. Now, if uh, I uh, consider the, the simplest possible case, uh, when I had a deterministic system, then uh, Actually, uh, this kind of uh, model with a neural network as a universal approximator turned out to work really well. Um, so as you can uh, see, basically, I was able to train the model to replicate uh, uh, what the underlying model does and, and what the, the measured or, or, or uh, in this case, the simulated uh, periodic solutions uh, were. Um, but I also added uh, uh, the bifurcation diagram of the pure physics-based model just to highlight that in this case, the difference between the behavior 
of the ground truth model and the physics-based core of the universe, a differential equation model wasn't that uh, large. So in this case, I really just compensated for a small error uh, in the model. So we can uh, kind of say that, okay, this worked really well, but this was probably not a very realistic example. So I just try to um, uh, increase the complexity a little bit by considering process noise. And in this case, I use Gaussian process as the universal approximator, which still uh, worked quite well. Um, basically, the important conclusion in this case was that quite predictably, the signal to noise ratio was important, um, which uh, unfortunately also kind of limited the amount of noise one could actually consider in the model because uh, the acceleration data was more uh, prone to the um, prone to noise excitation than the trajectories uh, in case uh, of the neural network based models this is basically the reason why i um, use the neural network based model when i when i try to train the model uh, for actual uh, measurement data take, taken from the physical experiment you can see the right hand side of my slide um basically uh preconditioning the measurement data and 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 using it as a quasi deterministic uh training data um and as you can see basically uh it was it, it was possible to train a universal differential equation model which could replicate the measured uh, bifurcation diagram so we could say that uh, this is a relatively nice result Unfortunately, um, we found that uh, that solution was quite sensitive to the initial conditions of uh, the training algorithm. So actually, it, it very often uh, converts to a local minimum instead of a global one. And in this case, as you can see, the characterization of the, of, of the system behavior is, well, it's suboptimal, as, uh, as they say. Uh, so basically, this raised the question, how can we actually improve the robustness of the training procedure? And uh, an, an obvious thing, or at least it, it seemed to be obvious to me, that uh, the current training framework or, or the training framework I used previously didn't really utilize the information that we are actually dealing with systems with periodic solutions. It was just a result. Um, that kind of indirectly uh, was in there, but there was no direct information about this. So what I tried to do that instead of using an initial value problem solver, uh, as is the case with the diff EQ flux package, I uh, tried to do something similar with a boundary value problem solver. And uh, I can see I don't have too much time, so I just uh, try to show the results and wrap this up quickly. But basically, I have a very simple example of this when uh, I'm using the technique of numerical collocation. And uh, once again, I'm just um, uh, comparing the, the identified periodic solution to the measured data, or in, in this case, it's actually generated uh, by a numerical model. So basically, what I do in this case that I'm just trying to do um, the damping parameter in the damping oscillator model, whereas the other uh, system parameters I fixed. And uh, this could be done with uh, relatively good accuracy, uh, finding, uh, uh, find it, finding a solution that is very close uh, uh, to the original value. And, and, and as you can see, the identified model fits uh, really bad to the measurement data, but this is uh, really just for trying whether uh, this type of concept could work. It's very old, very early days because um, I, of course, just identified a simple parameter, not really the uh, train the neural network or, or, or any more complicated model, but that would be the, the goal in this case. So to summarize these things, uh, uh, my, and, and my presentation, basically, this is uh, very much an exploratory study, mostly to find out uh, the potential of, of universal differential equation models for nonlinear dynamical systems. And uh, 
basically one of the main conclusion I could draw from from uh, my results is that uh, it very much depends on the complexity of the problem. So if the difference between what the physics-based model can do and what we see in the experiment is small, then usually the model tends to tends these models tends to work well. If uh, the, 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 the measure of behavior is more complex, then we may have further difficulties and, and, and the training procedure is often less robust. So, um, and basically the, the, my idea and concept to, to improve this and tailor this to work well with bifurcation diagrams would be to, to change uh, for a boundary value problem solver in the algorithm. Thanks very much for your attention. And I would like to uh, draw your attention to a preprint that's uh, available on archive. So if you found it interesting, then uh, please have a look at that. Thanks very much. Well, thanks a lot, Sandra. Uh, this is a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time for questions. So if you do get questions in the Discord, uh, do hop on there and answer them there. Uh, but I will start the next speaker. Um, so, and uh, I want to very quickly welcome uh, Stefan Ridderbush, Ridderbush, sorry. Um, and he's going to tell us about universal differential equations with Gaussian processes. Take it away. Um, hello, everyone. Um, first off, my apologies. I'm currently, uh, COVID is still a thing that exists. So I apologize for my voice and uh, occasional moments of confusion. Um, so in this talk, I want to talk about universal differential equations, which we all know with um, neural networks, but now let's talk about how this could potentially be done with Gaussian processes. This is based on work that I've done with, um, with Paul Goulart, as I'm a student at uh, Oxford University for the Center of Doctoral Training in Autonomous Intelligent Machines and Systems, in collaboration with Christian Offen and Zina Oberlöbaum from the University of Paderborn in Germany. Um, so let's start by talking about the motivation. And I'm not going to talk all too much about this because for a lot of um, for basically, I think most most of the listeners here who are familiar with the um, SciML ecosystem, um, a lot of this is is, is potentially well known. Um, if you look at the literature, then you will find that a lot of Gaussian process um, machine learning papers for dynamic systems are learning the discrete flow maps. So there we we have a function that, if you give it a state, gets you the state after a certain fixed time step. That works very well because it fits directly with the trajectory data that we have usually available. Um, and uncertainty propagation is quite easy because it is just a chain of, um, of functions f uh, represented by a Gaussian process. Um, so there, there are sort of nice approximations available there. But unfortunately, the step size is fixed. You can only have the step size that you trained your model with. Um, and because you're learning effectively the flow map, chaotic and complex systems can be quite hard. Um, especially if there's a sensitivity to the initial value. So instead, let's consider continuous vector fields. Uh, and this is sort of why what we all know and like. Um, we have um, a function, and if we give it a state, it gets us back, uh, if it gets us back the gradient at that location. Um, usually, for most ODEs, the vector field is a lot less complex than the flow that you get when than you get when solving it. Um, and also, if you have the vector field, now you can choose the step size freely and you can choose the solver freely, which is where if you have the, the wide array of solvers from, from the DiffEQ ecosystems available, uh, is quite valuable. Um, unfortunately, the data to learn these models is not directly available, um, as we usually don't have the gradient observation, we only have trajectories. Um, and uncertainty propagation through an arbitrary solver is very, very difficult. Um, so now to the part that really, I think, um, I think other speakers have also already talked about. What we want to do is we want to combine data and model knowledge um, because that is substantially more powerful than having e either of those individually. Um, we ideally want, want a model which can take data for um, especially terms that are difficult to describe analytically. But if we have some analytic knowledge or some assumptions, qualitative assumptions that we can make about a system, it'd be very nice if we could incorporate those as well. Um, combining those two gets us usually, or should should get us better extrapolation performance um, structure that we can potentially exploit, and as a result, usually often cheaper training. So, effectively, 
universal differential equations in the neural networks have shown that that what I've just talked about can be done. But now let's do it with Gaussian processes. Talking about Gaussian processes, the first thing that we need to talk about is that I've already mentioned this before, we don't have derivative data available. But GPs need explicit input and output pairs, um, at least sort of in their most naive implementation. Um, and also for some less naive implementations. Um, we have trajectory data with, with time steps and states, um, potentially with noise. But now what we need is states and gradient observations. Um, and all, a, a potential option to get these would be to differentiate along the trajectory. Um, and we could do this, for example, with finite differences, or we do kernel or GP regression. Um, given that this is a talk about GPs, um, let's just assume we, we fit a GP to our time series. And then because GPs are close on a linear operators and differentiation is a linear operator, we can very, we can analytically differentiate that time series and get um, der der derivative uh, information. Um, this is where the many uh, automatic differentiation to, uh, frameworks that we can find in Julia really come in handy. Um, and because it is so easy to incorporate automatic differentiation, there's some interesting um, ideas and perspectives for end-to-end -end treatment of uncertainty. But more on that potentially later. Um, so in Julia specifically, um, there's already a very rich ecosystem of uh, various Gaussian process related um, tools. First of all, a common problem with GPs is that they are very um, computationally uh, intense because the computational cost scales with the number of data points that we have available. Um, a very common way to address these is to use sparse approximations, some of which are already implemented in the approximate GPs package. Uh, and the idea here is that we reduce the data that we have to only M inducing points, where M usually is much less than the number of the total number of data points. So now we only have this cubic scaling with, with the, the number of inducing points that we chose. And potentially, depending on how we choose those um, inducing points, we can even get structure in our kernel matrix, which we can then exploit when we invert it. Now we have certain modeling choices, similarly to neural networks, um, where we can choose the number of layers or the number, number of neurons per layer. Um, and for GPs, this is the first choice that we, we, we can make is to choose the kernel. Uh, and there's a very large number of kernels in the kernel functions.jl package. It is really, um, I think it's been described as the workhorse of the um, GP ecosystem. Um, as most kernels there are very optimized and they're all, um, and they're, they're all ready for automatic differentiation. To choose the inducing points that we might want to use to reduce and reduce the computational load, there's the package inducingpoints.jl, which has various methods to choose inducing points, including some online methods, which, which can adapt the inducing points as more data comes in. And we can also choose different cost functions, some of which are implemented in the GP likelihoods package. Um, but I've also mentioned before that we have the qualitative structure that we would like to incorporate. And for certain qualitative structures, GPs are a very good tool to use. Um, first of all, fixed points. In a lot of instances, we know where um, the system is at rest. And um, if, we, if we know this, this steady state um, for a given system, we can trivially add this to the derivative data set that we feed into the GP. And I'll show an example of doing this later. Um, further, we can also very nicely incorporate linear Lie group symmetries. Um, there is um, a kernel class called the GIM kernels for group integration matrix kernels, which allow us to, if we know that a system has a certain um, Lie group symmetry, we can define a kernel in this fashion. And um, 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 sorry. Um, okay, we can we can get this in a um, um, we can we can define this this uh, this kernel with this uh, integral, uh, and then if we define if we then sample from the resulting GP using this kernel, we're guaranteed that the function that we get out of that has the symmetry that we want. Um, for an example. Um, 
here is the spiral ODE, which some of you may have already seen the diff EQ flux um, example zoo. Uh, and here we compare the top row here are the GP based approaches. We see that in both cases, um, they do correctly convert to a fixed point. Um, here for the right one, we have explicitly added zero as a known fixed point, and we find that it indeed does converge correctly. Um, here it converges to somewhere else, but critically it does converge. Um, even sort of beyond the original data that was provided. Um, by contrast, the neural network example seems to go into some sort of limit cycle. Um, and this is previous work using GPs in, um, um, in ODEs. Um, but unfortunately, it completely misses even the original data. But it does um, convert correctly close to zero. Um, on a slightly shorter time, time scale, looking at this here, we see that um, the vector field gets captured quite well by most methods. Um, but sort of as we could have expected from the previous slide, um, the GP-based approaches fit here, fit quite well here. Um, and we can even get uncertainty propagate like, like estimates for the uncertainty as we start to extrapolate beyond the originally provided data. Unfortunately, for this plot, um, the uncertainty was computed using very expensive sampling methods, um, which are not very practical um, in most use cases. So we're currently working on some more efficient ways to make this happen. For an example, for incorporating um, um, symmetry, let's look at the Kepler problem, um, which uh, is defined by the Lagrangian, by the, uh, which is the, defined by the uh, following Lagrangian, which we can see as a rotational symmetry. Uh, and then if we build the corresponding GIM kernel and then do um, then identify the system based on sort of one rotation of the um, of the body, we find that it does indeed sort of fit the the, the, the GP solution does indeed fit very well um, with the um, with the ground truth, especially, the critical line here to look at is the brown one. It does like the ideally the the, the first integrals should be perfectly preserved. Um, the brown line has shows some um, light drift, um, which uh, is due to numerical issues currently. Um, so, how does that incorporate into SciML? Um, ideally, what we what would be nice is if it would be possible to just swap in and out neural networks and GPs when trying to identify a system so that <clears throat> um, so that uh, one can one can see which which one works which works better for a given problem um, and to do this there's currently two um, packages that sort of reflect what I've just shown the first one is Gaussian process ODEs um, that is unfortunately I wrote this about a year ago it is unfortunately mostly research code it does work. It has um, its nice bits, but it is not very extendable. So now, more recently, I have started to build GIF, uh, GP DFQ, um, which I hope can be a very lightweight package to co to really connect um, the existing tools from the Ju Julia Gaussian process or processes organization, um, as well as DFQ and Flux packages, um, so that that. As all of these parts get more powerful, the aggregate also gets better. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot left to do. Um, in the Julian Julia Gaussian Processes organization itself, um, I, I would like to improve the multi-output API. While multi-output processes have been implemented, um, I think last year, um, there's a bit of quality of life currently missing um, that I would like to improve upon. Um, and more approximation models um, should be added to the approximate GP package. Um, and to be to be nicely used in an ODE model, um, these G it should be easier to rebuild the, the, the GPs as, as necessary. Um, in GPDFQ, um, this is currently a package um, that I would best describe as end-to-end -end ready to be fixed, which is a, a model that I've stolen from somewhere. Um, it sort of does all of the things broadly that I would like it to do, but now everything needs to be improved. Everything needs to be tested better, better documented, and more examples. Um, 
all of that then leads to the very big question I've already mentioned this before uncertainty propagation um, how does one send prob uh, uncertainty through an arbitrary solver um, not so trivial even for the for the explicit Euler method um, gets extreme and like, substantially more complicated with any other solver um, so I'm still working on that one um, yeah in summary GPs can complement neural networks when building universal differential equations. And I hope that at some point we get to a point where they can be used very simply and interchangeably. Um, there are many opportunities to incorporate additional knowledge and assumptions in GPs that are very difficult to incorporate in neural networks. Um, and Julia really is the perfect uh, knowledge to do this, uh, the perfect language to do this in, because there's already a very extensive Gaussian processes uh, ecosystem. Um, there is SIML, which is why we're all here today. Um, and it would be very nice if we could combine all of them. Um, if you have any questions um, about this, please get in touch. And I think I'm not sure how I am on time, but I might stop it here no, and you, take questions. You, you, you have five minutes left for, for questions. Um, so I have one question from YouTube uh, already. Uh, Fossi, thank you for the for the talk. This was very enjoyable. Um, you have you have great pictures on the slides as well. I, I really like them. Anyway, um, so the, there's a question from YouTube. Uh, Stefan, uh, have you have you sort of done any experiments comparing you know GPS and, and polynomial chaos uh, you know type uh, approximators or any other types of approximators that you would use in you know uncertainty quantification? Um, I have I have not yet, but I would I would like to. Um, I think this is this is something where again having been being on the vector field level um, um, is much more powerful than being on the on the flow flow um, flow map level that GPS are usually used at used on. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. All right. Um, I also have a question from Discord. Um, has there been work in hierarchical methods, uh, which try to sort of identify topological characteristics? Um, um, from, and using GP methods to fit based on identified features. I'm not familiar with with um, these hierarchical methods, um, but I would be very curious um, what they are and and see. Like I'm sure I'm sure that something could be done. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sure the person um, who's asking the question on Discord is is somebody you could get in touch with and 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 sort of explore further. Um, let me see. I um, in the meantime, I also had a question. Um, how um, how difficult it is uh, is it to sort of um, you know get these get these things to converge sometimes uh, you know um, have you you know especially with arbitrary kernels that you would have in in in, in kernel functions is it is it is it, uh, it is it difficult depending on which kernel you choose etc uh, etc cetera, et cetera, and do you have to do any sort of uh, a conditioning of your data for that in the first place um, so so. I that sort of part of my of my um, motivation to really build this um, this this package to to uh, to build upon the the uh, Julia processes, Julia Gaussian processes uh, organization is to make it much easier to test various different kernels, to really look at like really look at this sort of very like very widely. Um, so far, like in my old package, where they had to implement a lot of things myself, um, which sort of limited what I could do. Um, in my tests so far, I found that actually Gaussian processes are quite like very, very nice to optimize. Um, they have usually much, much fewer um, parameters. And like, it's not like in your network where you have like 250, 500 or so um, um, optimization variables. Like sometimes you can, you can get by with only three, um, which means that that optimization can be very, very fast. Um, and yeah, and even even then, if if uh, there's certain certain methods where you optimize the placement of the inducing points, which then adds number of inducing points times dimension, um, additional variables, even that is sort of still less than than a typical neural network might have. Um, so yeah. And I guess um, as a final question, perhaps uh, you you said that um, you know uncertainty propagation through solvers can get very complicated, uh, you know, especially with the you know, uh, with the ex even with an explicit Euler method, could you could you comment a bit more about that so you know we get a better picture of what you're saying? Well, well, essentially, essentially the the problem is that um, um, we, a normal distribution mapped to a nonlinear function is no longer a normal distribution. Usually, it is even no longer symmetric. 
Um, and then the question really becomes, how can you find an approximation that captures that correctly and, and, and keeps, and even like, because, because if, you, if you do the wrong kind of mistake, it compounds. So you have to somehow find an approximation that that is is um, sort of sent like stable against compounding in a certain way that like it, it doesn't make the same error every time so that 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 error sort of keeps keeps building and um, that is currently the, the the challenge that i'm that i'm going into um, because if you if you then allow like an arbitrary distribution and you just met have an arbitrary distribution through nonlinear function then you know then you're back to sampling methods effectively um, so like sampling is always possible, but it would be nice to have something that uses a, like some cheap approximation, but it is currently not clear to me. I've tried a few different things. It's currently not clear to me what that approximation would need to be. I see that, that that's fascinating. Maybe uh, folks have opinions in the, in the chat. Um, but I, but I, I should thank you once again. Uh, I know you're not well today and you, I really appreciate you coming out and, and giving the stock and your, and your voice and everything went, went great. So want you to be assured of that. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks again, Stefan. Uh, all right. Um, our next and final talk of the session before we take a break is Raj Dandekar. Um, and we're going to talk, he's going to talk about UDEs and epidemiology. Uh, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can see my screen. Uh, so today, uh, I'll be talking about the role of UDEs in uh, epidemiology. And in doing so, I will introduce a new way uh, to do epidemic modeling. This work has been done with Chris Rakaukas and uh, also in collaboration with George Barbastatis here at MIT. At the end of this presentation, we'll be able to answer the following questions. Number one, how different were the COVID-19 quarantine policies implemented by India and South Korea? Number two, how many infections would have been saved if the southern US states did not reopen early? Can we predict the next wave of the pandemic? And fourth, what is the optimal social distancing or lockdown policy which should be enforced? We'll try answering these questions with the new, with the new framework uh, with its roots in scientific machine learning. So I've divided this presentation into two parts. The first part is the KSIR model and its applications. And the second one is the Safe Blues project. So let's dive into part one first. The SIR model is the most traditional uh, epidemiological model. So S stands for susceptible, I for infected, and R for recovered. It essentially uh, describes a transition from the susceptible to the infected compartment and from the infected to the recovered compartment. So here you can see the blue dots are susceptible, which slowly become infected, which is shown by the red dots. And finally, they become removed or recovered, which is shown by the gray dots. This interaction is represented by a set of uh, ordinary differential equations as shown here. It is because of this that the SIR model is popular because it's very interpretable in nature. However, it has a number of assumptions, one of them being that uh, the assumption of homogeneous mixing, that is a person's contacts are randomly distributed among the population. There is no provision to include non-uniformities like quarantine or social distancing, etc., in a person's contacts. However, during COVID-19, we saw that it's these very non-uniformities that really shape an infection growth curve, which is seen in a particular country. For example, if you look at the diagram of North Korea's infection, we can see that due to the aggressive quarantining and the social distancing measures which they implemented, the infections were really curtailed after the first wave. However, you can contrast that with the graph of USA, where we can see that there were a number of uh, peaks in terms of the infected cases because of poor quarantining and uh, social distancing policies. What we really want to do is now incorporate these complex effects in the SIR model. So let's see at a micro level what such, a, such an effect would look like. So either it's something on the left, which is we quarantine or isolate a portion of the infected population and then we prevent them from coming into contact with the rest of the population or it's something on the right, which simulates a kind of a lockdown situation where a person really only interacts with their neighbors and uh, uh, there's a distance range which we impose on the interactions. What we want to do is model these complexities, but without resorting to complicated agent-based models. We somehow want to retain the ODE structure, which the SIR model has, but also simulate these complex effects. The way we will do this is we will develop a machine learning augmented SIR model, which takes into account these quarantining or social distancing effects. In particular, we will look at UDEs. So 
uh, you may ask how are we planning to do that so the way we'll do this is we'll represent these quarantining or social distancing effects as neural networks and then learn them based on the country specific data towards the end what we'll see is that these resulting models which are augmented by neural networks are not only expressive but they are also very good diagnostic tools they are interpretable in nature which lead to very powerful uh, globally applicable diagnostic tools so let's look at how this qsr model is constructed we know what we want to simulate we essentially want to um, isolate a portion of the infected population and prevent them from coming into contact with the rest of the population so intuitively we know that we need to subtract a term from the infected population but we don't know the form which the term will take so we'll use a neural network to approximate that term essentially the Q the sir model is converted to something of this form so here you can see that in the infected compartment we have a neural network subtraction term which represents this transition to this quarantine compartment or isolated compartment so we have one more compartment here and this is the addition additional neural network now we want to train this QSIR model on country specific data. To do that, we will need to optimize the parameters of the neural network to minimize the loss between our model and the data. To do so, we'll need to take derivatives of the loss function with respect to the neural network weights. And for this, we'll use the adjoint equations. So adjoint equations essentially let us calculate derivatives of uh, uh, functions of ODE solvers with respect to neural network parameters. Uh, I won't go into too much detail into these adjoint equations, but basically uh, they are a set of ODEs. And once we solve them, we can get a gradient of the loss function with respect to the neural network weights. And then we can perform gradient descent routines to optimize these weights. All of the modeling, which modeling results, which are shown later are done in the Julia language. Uh, so now let's look at the results. Once we optimize this QSR model, we can apply this to a number of different countries all over the world. Firstly, we can see that uh, compared to the baseline data, the model does pretty well. So the red, red bars here rep represent the infected population data in the country in Italy. And uh, the timeline, just to give you a sense, we looked at February 2020 to May 2020, so roughly about three months. And we can see that and the blue is the recovered data. We can see here that the QSR model captures the trend in the underlying data for both the infected and the recovered population. This may not be too surprising since we have neural networks. We expect the model to be expressive. What is probably one of the important takeaways from this presentation is this plot here. If you look at the so first of all, this plot is for China. The black dots here represent the quarantine strength, which is recovered by our neural network. It's the optimized neural network output, and we are calling it the recovered quarantine strength. It shows this particular variation. The red line is the time at which a ramp up is detected in this uh, quarantine strength. What we noticed is that this, this time is actually very similar to the time at which a government lockdown was imposed in China. And that was a great news for us because if this is true, then the model can really be used as a diagnostic tool to understand what's going on um, in the particular country. Now we wanted to test this particular thing on several different countries. And we saw that for a wide range of countries, the time at which the recovered quarantine strength, which is the red line here, shows a ramp up in our neural network optimized function lies very similar to the time at which the government lockdown was imposed or quarantine measures were strengthened in the region under consideration. We eventually did this for uh, 75 different countries, which is hosted. The results are hosted at this particular site. You can check this out. And we essentially showed that the model which you developed, the QSIR model, is not only very expressive in nature, but it can be used as a powerful diagnostic tool to understand what's happening on ground in the particular country. So this makes this model pretty impactful as we have seen over the last one year. It has been used by in a number of different uh, areas. Uh, various national labs have, are using it. Silicon Valley startups have reached out to us and uh, academic institutions uh, are also using it. One of the key aspects because of which the model uh, can be further more useful is that it's flexible in nature. It doesn't need to stick to just the quarantine effects, but 
there's a for example there is a group of students at mit who is working on the vsir or the vaccination sir model in this they represent the vaccination term by a neural network and then they are applying this model to a number of different countries of the world this flexibility is also one key uniqueness of the models constructed using this uh, approach rooted in scientific machine learning we wanted to further test this model on to another different setting so we chose the we chose the time period of may to july 2020 and uh, we were especially interested in what happened in the united states during this particular period so if you look at this video we can see that during may to may to july 2020 the cases in europe were kind of reducing and stagnating but there was an exponential explosion in the number of cases which was seen in especially the southern and the west central uh, united states in particular we looked at these nine states which showed a huge surge in the number of infections now we wanted to ask the question that can we apply the qsir model here and can the model recovered q of t be correlated with early reopening in these states and secondly how many infections would have been reduced if these states had not reopened early okay so now we applied this model to number of different states and first i'm showing you this plot for the state of south carolina so there are number of things to unpack here so let me go step by step the red dots here represent the current neural network recovered quarantine strength by our model it shows a increase and a subsequent decrease what's great here is that the time at which there is a cusp seen in the recovered quarantine strength by our model actually matches very well with the time at which the stay at home order expired in the state of south carolina this shows that our model recovered quarantine strength q of t shows a drop when the state reopened which is here then what we did was okay what if the state had not reopened early and what if its quarantine strength had not decreased so what if the state had maintained its quarantine strength at this particular level what would have happened we simulated this particular scenario for the state of south carolina and we saw that the number of infections which are shown by this blue uh, blue line here would have been significantly less compared to the number of infections which are actually seen shown by these red bars so the second conclusion for this particular state was that in the event of a stricter lockdown the infections could have been reduced significantly so we had two basic uh conclusions which we wanted to check for all the states first the, do all the states for do this for all the states q of t show a drop when the state reopened and second in the event of stricter lockdown can infections have been reduced significantly in all of these states first thing which you observed is that for all nine states which we looked at our model shows a drop on q of t when the state reopened and secondly for all the states which you considered in the event of stricter lockdown the number of infections could have been reduced by significant amount so this study again confirmed the validity of the qsir model as a diagnostic tool finally uh, in the last 3 or 4 minutes i want to uh, talk about another project which is the safe blues project which we did through this project what we wanted to demonstrate was that virtual virus spread through bluetooth tokens can be used as an indicator for real time estimate of infection statistics this study is now being uh, conducted as an uh, experiment in the Auckland University uh, New Zealand so the main premise was this after a government policy is implemented such as lockdown mask measures etc it usually takes a week or two before realizing whether it's working or not so the question was can we really reduce this lag to zero and this is why we designed the safe blues campus experiment so how it works is as follows so let's say there are a number of students in a college campus we ask them to participate in this safe blues experiment once they agree to participate uh, they download the safe blues app and once they do that their phone is seeded with a huge ensemble of strands a strand has number of properties such as transmissibility incubation duration infection duration and a strand can spread across nearby smartphone through bluetooth communication so let's say if two students meet at a cafeteria and they interact then there is a and both of them have safe blue app then basically the strands can change properties based on whether it's infected or recovered etc then what we do is we train a neural network between the historical covid-19 data and the safe blues strands data the real 
key here is that the safe blue strands data is available to us in real time. So if we can train a deep neural network between the historical data and the real time safe blues data, we can have a real time prediction without any lag of the epidemic trajectory. The key point here is that uh, biological pathogens and uh, Bluetooth both have proximity as the key factor which governs their transmission. So we constructed a deep neural network and we trained it. So this plot kind of summarizes uh, the conclusions. If you look at the red dots here, this is the infected data which we only have up till this time. Whereas the blue strands are the safe blues strands which are available to us in real time. So it's available year, even up till year, let's say two weeks after the point during which the infected data is available. And based on this data, we train a neural network between the infected data and the safe blues data, and then we forecast. And then what we can see is that if you look at the forecasted data, the prediction which is shown by this blue line matches very well with the true data during this time, which is shown by these yellow circles. So I'm going a bit fast through this in the interest of time. But if you have any questions regarding this, please feel free to reach out. These are some preliminary results which were done in the Auckland University campus. And uh, at the heart of all of this is a scientific machine learning framework. So essentially, we have neural networks integrated with uh, SIR modules, which are used for predictions. And this type of a safe blues module can also be used for policy control. Essentially, we can ask questions like, OK, what is the lockdown strength which is required, which will get the effective reproduction number to less than one? It should not be too less or it shouldn't be too high. What is the optimal policy which can be implemented to get the reproduction number less than one? So safe blues methodology enables us to get real time estimates, real time estimates such as the ones presented here. So, okay, in conclusion, what we have shown and what we have seen generally is that neural network augmented frameworks, UDEs, can lead to powerful epidemiological models. These models are not only expressive and powerful, but also highly interpretable in nature. And they can potentially replace complex compartment models. In the future, we have an active collaboration which we are doing with Sandia Labs currently to test some of these methodologies on real data which they have. And we want to also integrate these uh, UDE framework with Bayesian modules so that we can do error quantification. And I would like to thank you for your time and would be happy to um, answer or discuss any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Raj. Um, uh, you could um, you could still share your screen if you if you'd like to skip over slides, um, yeah. but that's not crucial. Um, uh, so a great, great talk. I, I mean, I've seen previous versions of the talk, and I think you've really nailed it this time. It's fantastic. Uh, Thanks, I, I have one question from YouTube. Um, so uh, do you do Cindy or something similar to try and identify the symbolic form of the quarantine term Q? Yeah. So uh, what we have shown um, in one of our recent studies is that um, symbolic recovery can be done on these models. And we can essentially get the interaction terms like what the neural network actually represents. I plan to include it in this talk, but I thought that it would extend the time. But I will be definitely happy to chat further regarding this. So whoever has posted this question. Yeah, it's it's on it's on YouTube. You, you'll be able to find it on the on the live show. Yes. Um, uh, I, uh, I have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. why, why the why the SIR models? I'm sure there are like a, a million of these uh, these models out there, right? So why why do you why do you choose to add neural networks to that one, or why not a different one? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So first, we wanted to start out with the simplest model, and the SIR is one of the simplest compartment models out there. So it's a three compartment model, and after showing that it works indeed for three compartment models, and now we have even shown that it works for five or nine compartment models. So we just chose the SIR because it's simple, and uh, now we are moving to more complicated uh, models. I see. So in principle, you could you could use different ones, and you'll get different kinds of inter interpretability for each exactly, of them. exactly. Mm, I see. Um, and and uh, I think we have another minute, so I will I will follow up again and say, hey, mm -hmm. uh, what about the uh, the vaccine SIR model? Uh, what how how well is it doing? Do we do we get a sneak peek of the results there? 
that's a good question actually so the team who is working on that i think they started uh, four or five months back and uh, i still think they are working a bit more to polish the results but essentially there is a good comparison result between let's say the country of israel and some other countries so i think there are some good results to be expected in that study well that's a, that sounds very very exciting i think we're at the point where we all want to see mm-hmm. those types of results um, yeah all right i um i think i will close it off uh, uh close it off now and uh, give one minute to the audience and we have a 10 minute break now mm-hmm. um thanks again raj by the okay. way um thanks ranjit see you around um so we have um we have a 10 minute break now and and we will begin again at uh, 3 pm eastern all right and see you guys in about uh, 10 minutes
All right, we are back. Just going to, Rafael, I just added you to the stream along with your slides. Um, and we can begin uh, in approximately a minute. Sounds good. Can you hear me well? Yep, I can hear you well, and your slides are visible. My slides are visible. Let me check. Am I changing the slide now? Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah, you um, can flip through them if you'd like as well, I mean. Yeah. All looks. Um, yeah. Can I can I start now? Yeah, let me let me uh, wait. Uh, it's 2.59. Yeah, now, yeah, let me introduce you first. So um, I welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, it, it is our pleasure to, to invite uh, Rafael Pestori from MIT to uh, give us a talk on physics enhanced deep surrogates that are trained end to end. Hi, um, I am. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranjan, for the introduction. Uh, so I am a postdoctoral associate uh, in the math uh, mathematics department at MIT, and today I'm presenting about physics enhanced uh, deep surrogate trained end to end using Julia. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with uh, Youssef Mwue and Payel Das from IBM and uh, uh, Chris and uh, Steven Johnson um, from uh, MIT. Um, and so uh, what, is, what is a surrogate model? Uh, it is a learned model that fits a particular outcome of a partial differential equation, uh, which I will call PDE. Uh, and it, it is not a solver. Uh, that will compute the solution for the PDE, uh, but rather a data-driven model, which will fit a particular property of the PDE solution. For example, in uh, optics, uh, um, uh, where the PDE, uh, PDE is our Maxwell's equation, um, you can see on this image, um, a surrogate um, that is fitted to pre predict the complex transmission um, uh, through a structure uh, based on the parameters of the geometry here, the, the width of all those little rectangles over the 10 layers that you can see. And another parameter of the surrogate model uh, are the, is the frequency of the incoming light. Um, and today, I uh, will show uh, results for this uh, specific surrogate model. Um, at evaluation time, um, since a surrogate model does not solve uh, for the PDE solution, but rather evaluates a fit, uh, surrogate models are orders of magnitude faster than PDE solvers. For an application like uh, this one in optics, a typical speedup would be 10,000 times faster in 2D uh, simulations uh, and uh, a million times faster for a 3D simulation. Um, uh, sorry. Um, and, and in practice, in optics, this surrogate model is used in conjunction with uh, decomposition methods um, for a very computationally challenging simulation problem, such as computing the light scattered by a metal surface. And if you are more interested, I'm not going to talk about it today, but if you are interested in, in, uh, into this, uh, please refer to my previous work in Optics Express. Um, uh, but but there's no uh, free lunch. The fast evaluation uh, time uh, comes at the cost of generating a lot of training data, which uh, involves um, computing PDE solutions many times. And so data generation uh, re is really the bottleneck of uh, high dimensional surrogate models. Um, note that like surrogate models are also become more costly as the number of inputs uh, dimensions increases. But the bottleneck is the cost of the generation of the data. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on uh, in my talk today. Um, and and uh, a, a first a surrogate model, a traditional one that works very well for up to four or five parameters uh, is Chebyshev interpolation. Chebyshev polynomials are great because they are exponentially convergent uh, for a smooth function. And so it, less, it requires less expensive PDE solves to train. Um, and, and these two images here, the top left and the bottom right, um, shows that like the choice of point is important. The strength of Chebyshev interpolation comes from its uh, polynomials and its uh, special set of training points that you can see at the bottom left, uh, the Chebyshev points. Uh, 
for the same function, uh, the top left image uses Chebyshev points and the bottom right uses equally spaced points. And the latter presents uh, very big artificial uh, oscillations, which are a catastrophe for uh, surrogate models, which is called Runge phenomenon. And uh, here it really shows that, um, yeah, the choice of points uh, really matters. Unfortunately, uh, for um, Chebyshev polynomials, uh, it requires uh, for like a polynomial of degree n in each direction, it requires n plus one uh, points. And so for p parameters, you would need uh, n plus one to the power of p points uh, to train uh, your surrogate model. And so the, the number of points um, uh, really quickly becomes intractable as the number of parameter increases. Uh, and this is called the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and so in contrast to polynomials, uh, neural networks seem to alleviate the curse of dimensionality. Uh, neural networks are now very popular. It is an algorithm with thousands to millions of parameters, which take uh, an input, uh, does a bunch of matrix multiplications composed with nonlinear activation functions on multiple layers. Research is still active to understand why they work so well, but they have had a lot of practical successes, in particular, as surrogate models in optics. But again, there's a trade-off between accuracy and training time. A neural network uh, with many parameters might be more expressive, but it will be more expensive to evaluate and take more data to train. Again, today we are going to focus on alleviating the training cost, which is dominated by data generation. When and why should we use neural networks instead of brute force solvers for PDEs? Um, in optics, at least, a lot of people are trying to use neural network, um, but our physics model is great in optics. And like uh, for some other problems where neural network are used, like uh, face recognition. Um, and, and so in the top left of this slide, uh, I show uh, uh, another French man, a French man like me, André-Marie Ampère, and in the top right, James Clerk Maxwell. And, uh, them and a lot of other people worked really hard to have a very good physical model for electromagnetic waves. And, and neural networks, uh, the vanilla neural networks at least, don't, don't have physics in them. And so it's very difficult to compete with physical models and um, brute force solvers. And often um, you are better off solving for Maxwell's equation with a good brute force model uh, uh, directly. However, um, Surrogate models are a complete case for using neural networks because they can be reused millions of time and evaluate much faster than solving for the PDE. And so over time, you can amortize the training cost. And also they seem to handle uh, uh, high dimensional inputs well, so it makes them great candidates for surrogate applications. Later in this talk, I'm presenting ways to include the physical knowledge uh, of the PDEs inside the deep surrogate. So today I will focus on the topic of data efficiency, and I will start by mentioning briefly an active learning algorithm, which I published a couple years ago, and I'm currently expanding uh, Coded in Julia with Ranjan and Antaraman. Um, and the question uh, for this type of uh, project is how can we use feedback from the surrogate model as it learns to find an efficient set of training points? Uh, start with the results here. Here I showed a fractional error on a test set for three models. Uh, in green, uh, the Chebyshev interpolation, which uses Chebyshev points, and it performs the worst because it suffers the curse of dimensionality. Recall I'm using this surrogate model I introduced earlier with 10 geometry parameters. Uh, the orange and blue models are neural network surrogates, which can we can already see that the neural networks perform much better than polynomials. And the orange one was trained with randomly sample points, where, uh, uh, whereas the blue one was trained with points explored using our active learning algorithm. We see that uh, the blue model reaches an accuracy of 7% with about 20, uh, uh, 12 times less points than the orange model, showing the effectiveness of our active learning algorithm. And the active learning algorithm goes as followed. Um, the training set is initialized with a few sample, uh, a few points sampled at random. And then there are three steps. 
a, a training step first where uh, you train your data model on your current training set. And you train another model, which is your uncertainty quantification model, which will give you an estimate of how well, or uh, 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 give you an estimate of the error uh, of your data model for your surrogate model. And then you have a second step, the filtering step, where you evaluate your uh, uncertainty model, your uh, error estimate on n times k randomly sample points. And you select only the k points with the highest uh, uncertainty estimates. And there's a third uh, uh, step where you compute the points, but only for those with highest uh, estimated uncertainty. Uh, and then you add those to the training set. And uh, you repeat this uh, t times. Uh, and the result showed, uh, showed in the previous slide, uh, m was equal to 4. So I discarded 3 quarter of the randomly samples points before the PDA uh, 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 simulations. And t was equal to 8. So for each data set size, the data set was created by incrementally adding points to the training set eight times. And what is great about this uh, uh, algorithm is its generality. It's independent of the uncertainty quantification method. So you can use it with var a variety of UQ techniques. And in fact, you only need a monotonic function of the error. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, confidence uh, interval spread uh, would work just as well. And it's independent of the PDE. So, so it can work with any PDEs. And, uh, we've seen uh, already uh, 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 improvement and reduction in uh, need for data for Maxwell's equation, linear elastic mechanics, and uh, the Fourier heat equation. Um, and uh, in, in the NPG article from two years ago, I used uh, an ensemble of heteroscedastic regressions, uh, whose mean is the predictor. Um, uh, and uh, the, of the, for the complex transmission and the pool variance is the measure of uncertainty quantification. Uh, and, uh, here the, uh, and, and here the loss uh, function was the negative log likelihood of the model. Um, I'm using uh, this loss function uh, in the next part uh, of my talk. Uh, and, and in this application, the model serves both as predictor and as measure of uncertainty quantification, but technically, those two models don't need to be in the same. They can be separate. Uh, now I will focus on the second question. Uh, how uh, can we leverage field knowledge inside the surrogate? And this work was published at the end of last year on archive. Um, and indeed, there is a lot of field knowledge out there to, to leverage on for surrogate models. Uh, we know a lot of PDEs that uh, governs different physical processes in optics, um, thermal, uh, quantum physics, photovoltaics, climate well, modeling or mechanics. And so uh, coming back on our optics example, we want to fit. So I'm uh, looking at uh, the, this uh, 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 box, the, 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 rank, the rank top left rectangle, we want to fit the complex transmission computed by an accurate solver that is symbolized by a picture of James Clerk Maxwell. And the idea of the physics enhanced deep surrogate, the, the other box uh, called PEDS, uh, is to combine a neural network generator with a low fidelity model here symbolized by a cartoon of James Clerk Maxwell. In itself, the low fidelity model is very inaccurate with an error of more than 100%, uh, but it contains uh, knowledge of the physics. It contains Maxwell's equation, could contain, you know, in other applications, conservation laws. And, and it computes much faster than the high fidelity solver. The surrogate model takes the same geometry as the accurate solver. And inside PEDS, there are two channels. One is a field knowledge based transformation of the input to an input of the low fidelity solver. And the other goes through a generative neural network that will alter this low fidelity solver input. Trained end to end, the neural network generator finds the input to the low fidelity model that will result in the same complex transmission as the computationally closely accurate solver for Maxwell's equation. This type of surrogate model 
is about 10,000 times faster than solving for the Krusty Maxwell's equation directly in 3D. And here I'm presenting the fractional error with respect to the number of training data for these optic surrogate. Uh, and I compared the, the results of PETS combined with my active learning algorithm, which I presented before. Um, and, and I compared it to this, uh, the neural network only baseline and also to an improved baseline that uses active learning. And, and the, the improvement is really dramatic and potentially asymptotically faster. Looping back on the motivation for PEDS, uh, it can be applied to many different physics problems. Uh, a a low-fidelity model is very easy to find. It can be, for example, a model that is reducing the resolution. Um, it can be a model that is simplifying the physics, for example, I don't know, uh, um, removing a nonlinear term in the PDE. Uh, and, and you can apply this PET strategy for many physics problems. We're currently looking into uh, 3D Maxwell surrogates and surrogates for the Boltzmann transport equation. Wanted to um, talk about um, uh, th these projects are uh, now uh, both uh, fully implemented in Julia. Uh, the active learning project uh, uh, we're currently extended extending this active learning algorithm with Ranjan uh, and integrating it into Julia Sim circuit, JL. And for the physics enhanced deep circuit, I'm going to release the code soon. Uh, it's currently um, uh, uh, not really uh, open source ready, um, but uh, it, it was easily, uh, it was easy to stack the neural network with this like solver layer using uh, flux.gl and zygote.gl. And for the back propagation through the solver layer, uh, under the hood, what it's doing is an adjoint simulation that is uh, solved inside an R rule uh, that, that was like custom defined using chain rules.gl. Uh, and the code runs on CPU, unfortunately, because um, uh, it, it uses uh, sparse solves, which are not supported on GPUs. Uh, and solving for the low fidelity solver in my case required a sparse solve. Um, but I, I did parallelize the batch loop uh, when training uh, the model uh, using mpi.gl and the all reduce function, which also needed um, uh, another R, a specific R, R rule. I'm very excited uh, to be presenting uh, here and invited to uh, give this talk. And I am open to collaboration. So please uh, contact me if you want to use this framework for your own physical systems. And uh, I will also uh, yeah. uh, answer questions on yeah, Discord. Minutes uh, <laughs> uh, for for your talk, but but uh, but yeah, we can. Uh, let me quickly check the the, the Discord. Um, yeah, um, actually, um, maybe I should perhaps lead with my own question. Um, mm -hmm. So there's so you spoke about you know that you're looking at a coarse geometry and then you're you're using a generative network to uh, to generate the fine geometry and how do you train that generative network? Do you use like a multi grid method to figure out like an interpolation? interpolating factor between some coarse geometry and a fine geometry and just keep training that into tree, keep training that GAN to, to imitate that interpolation or how exactly do you train it? Yeah, so the, you know you have a lot of freedom uh, uh, in, in your generator. Uh, in the slides I've showed, it, it's actually um, uh, using a, the parameterization of the fine geometry. So it's, it, you know, it's using those width of the different rectangles. Uh, and then it's just a, a fully connected neural network that that uh, uh, outputs like the a, a coarsified uh, version of, uh, of the structure uh, that will you know result uh, in in the same um, uh, complex transmission uh, once you solve it with this low fidelity solver and so matching the high fidelity solver. Uh, but I'm also exploring. Uh, uh, and in another project, like uh, 
uh, more of a conver convolutional arch architecture when the input is just like the fine image directly. Um, and and right now it's it, there's no there's it, it's not like uh, adversarial uh, you know uh, type of approach. It's it's just uh, you you have this you have this generator um, uh, that's that uh, which output is used by your low fidelity solver, and, and then you're just tra training end to end to match uh, uh, the surrogate output that you need. Uh, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, There's a question from YouTube. Um, you mentioned earlier in the in the talk about drawing candidate points at random. Yeah. Uh, so it was like uniformly uh, at random. Oh. Uh, yeah. So that that's like uh, that's the baseline we used. Yeah. Okay. The the question is is what distribution that is, and you and you just uh, answered us. Yeah. Yeah. And and then basically the, this active learning uh, uh, algorithm is is really kind of a Bayesian algorithm where uh, you know you you're 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 basically changing the the the, the distribution of of uh, of your sample points by using this filtering technique. Um, you also have a couple of questions from Discord. So, um, does PEDS introduce a new level of opaqueness in the investigation of uh, the Maxwell equations? Uh, what does it mean by by opaqueness? Uh, it, it, I would say, if anything, it's it's adding knowledge and it's making it more interpretable. Uh, you can, for example, um, uh, inspect what uh, what is the generated uh, low fidelity structure. And uh, maybe make sense out of it. Um, uh, so, so in a sense of interpretability of your model, I think it's uh, and and you and then the low fidelity solver is really just like a solver for the PDE, so it's pretty interpretable. Okay, um, but I'm, I might have misunderstood the question. Yeah, no, I um, yeah, I guess that's that's one interpretation. Um, there's there's another one on Discord and on YouTube. So why do you need a, a, a sparse solve instead of a low resolution dense solve? You know, specifically when when talking about the FDDT simulation. Yeah, so it's an uh, uh, a frequency domain simulation. So you have you know uh, your your you you have your operator that is uh, you know matrix which is uh, uh, you know uh, very sparse. So you want to use this uh, property in order to uh, you know solve it efficiently and be able to scale it a bit. Okay, and um, I think the the person who asked the question about opaqueness, uh, they by opaqueness they meant that uh, you know there is there's an extra layer added, right? I mean, there's this generator layer added that that perhaps uh, is not interpretable, or perhaps is not uh, we that, that we don't quite may not know how to interpret as well. Uh, so, if you have any comments on that? Yeah, in in the archive paper, we actually have a whole section about. Um... Uh, 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 you know, physical insights uh, related to the the generator. Um, so you, you can see what it generates, and then you, uh, we did also some uh, PCA analysis of of the generator, and we could like uh, and 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 this all like the the results we found like all made sense. For example, uh, for um, higher uh, frequency, um, which corresponds to shorter wavelength. The generated structures like were varying va varying much more uh, compared to like low frequency uh, uh, type of gener uh, 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 generations. Okay, so I think um, I've exhausted the questions from YouTube and Slack, but I had one. I had one more on uh, on on geometries again. Aren't there other aren't there other types of methods out there that generate uh, geometries for you know for for PDE solutions? Um, and you know, if so, if, is is do you get a chance to look at it, any of the other methods? Um, so the the method I've um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but um, there is a, a whole literature on a technique called space mapping, um, and uh, the major difference is in space mapping the 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 dimension of the uh, the dimension of your low fidelity solver is the same as the dimension of your high fidelity solver. So you don't, you don't have that um, uh, that freedom uh, in the generate in the generator. You don't have as much freedom. Uh, so, but that's that's a very large literature over the past twenty years. Um, yeah. 
All right, that, that, that makes sense. There's, there's one more question on YouTube about benchmarks. Um, when you said your approach is faster than PD solvers, you know, how, how much faster? Um, when I approach what? Um, so supposing, um, you know, let's say you are solving the Maxwell's equations, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, versus yeah, yeah so, so so in order to get these complex transmission so like it's a surrogate model it's not a solver right so you you only care about the complex transmission for example or for some other applications uh in in thermal uh, you might uh care about the thermal conductivity of your your structure uh or like the young model is in linear elas uh, elastic mechanics uh, so there's just one number um and so uh, to to compute that number uh, it's, uh, for example, uh, go back in optics, uh, it was, it's uh, 10,000 times faster to evaluate that PEDS uh, compared to evaluating the brute force Maxwell solve. All right, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have 15 minutes until the, the next talk, but um, I think uh, maybe we'll, we'll close this talk and just uh, break for 15 minutes and come back. Oh, yeah. uh, th thanks again, Rafael. This is great. I, I really enjoyed it. All right, we are gonna take a break now and we will be back at 3.40 p.m. Uh, EST.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we will we will start the next talk very soon. Um, let me try and add the pre-recorded video here. Um, right, our next our next speaker is uh, Ching Yu Chu, um, who will be talking about fractional order computing and modeling with Julia. Um, this is a pre-recorded video, so um, once the video is, uh, make sure to ask questions on the chat that uh, Ching Yu can check out either, uh, you know, whenever it's uh, it's morning for him. So um, we would appreciate uh, we would appreciate you just directing the questions to the chat. And let me just start it off. Introduce to you how can Julia be used in fractional order computing and modeling? Well, we already studied classical calculus. We can get the derivative and integral of a function. But you may wonder, is there a half derivative or a quarter integral? The answer is yes, we have fractional calculus. So here we have a simple introduction of fractional calculus. Suppose we have a function fx equals cat power of x. Then we can get the first derivative and the second derivative. We can extend to the nth derivative. So here we replace n to a half. We can get the half derivative of fx. So you may be wonder, we already have classical calculus. What is the meaning of fractional order? So since the invention of fractional calculus, it has shown its powerful application in mathematics and engineering. So I believe fractional order modeling and computing will only become more and more appealing. So first, we will see the fractional calculus.gl. It's a package, it's a Julia package we can use to compute fractional calculus. There are different sets derivative and integral in fractional calculus. So we also have support for all these kinds, such as capital, remarkable, and other sets. The usage of fractional calculus.gl is very simple. Just call fractdiv and fractint and pass the function order the, the, the specific point and the step size and choose an algorithm to compute the derivative and the integral. So here is so here is the different order of different functions. With the help of symbolic utils.gl, we implement symbolic half-order fractional differentiation and integration. While these features are still in test periods, I think I still think these features can help researchers a lot. Then we can see the fractional diffeq.gl. Here is the problems overview of all of the problem types in fractional diffeq.gl. We have FOD problem, FPDE problem, FDDE problem, FIE problem, and many more. So we can start with the FODE problem, which is fractional ordinary differential equations. We can divide FODE problem into two classes. First, we will see the single term FODE which means there is only one fractional differential equation. There is only one fractional differential operator in the equation. All we need to do is define the problem by a similar to differential equations to GL by passing the function, order, initial condition, and the time span. Choose an Algorithm and both our solutions 
we can see the solver achieve a high precision. Then, we can see the multi-term FODE. There are many fractional differential operators in the, in the equation. So we, can def so we can abstract the mathematical models and define our problem by passing the parameters, orders, right-hand function, and time span. Choose an algorithm, then plot the approximating solutions. So then we can see the system of fractional differential equations. It's very easy to solve the system of FDE. But here, what I, what, what amazed me the most must be the enhancement of FDE solvers. So when in MATLAB, we, we are, so in MATLAB, we are, we are solving a trial system using FOTF toolbox. But it cost us 20 minutes to complete the simulation. Then we use Mat then we use then we from then we translate the code from MATLAB to Julia. Then we only cost eight minutes to complete the simulation. And that is just what we and that is we just translate the code from MATLAB to Julia. So I believe there will be more improvement in fractional difficulty GL. So here is some fractional order chaotic systems. Very beautiful. Then, then we can see the fractional partial differential equations. Uh, there are relatively little solvers for FPDE, mainly focused on diffusion equations and advection equations. But I think there will be more solvers in the future. Then we can see the fractional delay differential equations. It's also very easy to solve these problems. Abstract our mathematical models similar to differential equations or GL and choose an algorithm and solve the problem. Plus the numerical solution. We get the we got we get our solutions. Then it's very easy to solve system of FDDE. Just define problem, solve problem, and plot solutions. Yes. Okay. Then, then we can see the distributed order differential equations. So what is the distributed order? The, the the differentiation order is no longer integer or fractions, but the weight function of distribution of order. The, the mathematical definition is as follows. Similar with similar with mm, what we had what we said before, just define our problem by here is an example. Define our problem with parameters. Here we have the parameters or the order. The here the here the omega alpha is a function, and the right hand side choose a uh, and then pass pass the function, and uh, so here we choose a so choose a solver choose a solver. To solve this problem, then we plot, then we can plot our solution. Then we can see the fractional integral equation. Well, while well the well the FIE problem is still in test periods, but uh, it's very it is very exciting. With the help of approximate GL, fractional difficult difficult GL. Fractional difficult or GL is able to solve fractional integral equations. Like the example, we have second kind of integral equation. Similar with 
similar with before, similar with what we had, what we said before, like FOD problem, FTD problem. Here we define our FIE problem with these parameters, order, and right hand side. And to the solver, plot our solution. We get our we get our approximating solution. So then, is a, we take a lesser function as the queen function in fractional calculus. Many uh, many solutions of fractional differential equations are in forms of we take lefer function. In fractional GL, we have built in we take lefer function computing. We support one parameter, two parameter, and three parameter we take lefer function computing. So here, here is the different order of we take lefer function. Yeah, this is the one parameter version. Okay. I have to I have to admit there are also some imperfects in in these libraries. There are still more there are still a lot of works we need to do in the future. For example, the design pattern and the, the benchmarks. Also, the documents. There are some missing documents we need to we need to fix. So here inside ML conference, I call for developers who interested in fractional differential equations and Julian to join us. So our mission, uh, our mission is to make the fractional order modeling and computing. More easier with Julie. Yes. Okay. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Chingyu. We apologize for the uh, the audio issues here. Um, you know, while while these audio issues are uh, undesirable at virtual conferences, they are just far too co common. Um, so um, we we again we have uh, time to spare before our next talk. So what we're going to do is take a break until our next talk, which will start at four p.m. Um, all right. See you. Uh, see you guys in a bit. Don't forget to ask Chingyu questions in in the Discord so that he can get to them. Thank you.
All right, the music should have stopped playing. Um, all right, uh, Gabriel, I'll uh, quickly introduce you, and you could start at uh, 4 p.m. sharp. That sounds good. Uh, you are on mute, by the way. Can you hear me all right now? I can hear you all right now, and your and your screen is visible too. So that sounds good. Yes. All right. Um, right. It, it's for so I'll introduce you. Um, um, please let me welcome uh, Gabriel Birnbaum, who's going to talk to us about modeling plasma ph physics with neural PDs. .gif. Cool. Thank you. So, hi everyone. So my name is Gabriel Birnbaum, and I'm an independent computational scientist based in San Francisco. Um, during the day, I actually work at a tech startup here uh, called Substack, and at night, I work on like modeling differential physics, which I find quite neat as a little hobby. Um, and today, I want to talk to you about how I used um, Neuro PDE to solve some plasma physics models and to build Plasma JL, which is this interface to make it easier for others to do the same. So we're going to talk about building this interface, extending Neuro PDE to these use cases, and generally working with physics-informed physics neural networks. So first, let's talk about what is a plasma. Not to be confused with the blood plasma, or what we're talking about here is the superheated matter, also known as the fourth state of matter. So when something is very cold, it is in a solid state. You heat it up a bit, it becomes a liquid. You heat it up more, it becomes a gas. And when you heat up a gas to a certain point um, in really extreme temperatures, the electrons are basically ripped away from the atoms, making it an ionized gas. Um, which is also called a plasma. And these gases, they're electrically conducting systems and their behavior is pretty complex. As you can see, you know, gas models are already pretty complex to model. And once one adds electrodynamics to it, the system becomes even more um, intricate. But in any case, plasma is pretty important. It comprises over 99% of the visible universe. Stars are plasmas, nebulas are plasmas. And um, it is the active goal of um, uh, part of astrophysics and much of nuclear fusion research to predict um, the behavior and movement of plasmas. So I guess the question comes up that how does one model plasmas? And one way to do that is through the Vlasov equation. And this Vlasov model is one of the most accurate models that we have to model plasma behavior. It's a kinetic model. And it describes the time evolution of the distribution function of a plasma. It is also one of the most complex models that we, we have in plasma physics. Um, as you can see here, um, a lot of math. We don't need to worry too much about um, it. It's, Gabriel, um, are you are you uh, change are you uh, changing your slides there? Uh, because yeah. we cannot see the, the slides changing. Oh, that is odd. Did you see okay. this change? Uh no. Um, you see this? Ah, now, now I can see it's changed. That Let's is. do it like this then. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, okay, so we were here. What is a plasma? And now we're talking about plasma and the Vlasov equation. Sorry about that. Moving along. So basically, um, the as I was saying, the Vlasov equation describes the time evolution of the distribution function of plasmas, and it is a pretty complex model. Um, I'm not going to go into the math here per se, but as you can tell here, this is, this is pretty complicated. It is um, a, a phase space model, so it, it can be up to six dimensions plus time. Um, so uh, you need to know the position and velocity of each particle um, or um, at each point, which is you know um, a lot of dimensions. It is also a self-coupling system. So here the distribution function f. Um, describes um, and defines rho and j. And rho and j basically um, define the electro electric and magnetic fields E and B. And these fields then impact F. So this makes the system pretty nonlinear. Um, and that is like sort of a, a really part, hard, ma makes the whole system fairly hard to um, model as well. And th because of that, it is pretty hard to solve this numerically. And we still don't have good models for it. Um, and you know, s some other things make it harder, like the system needs to conserve um, charge and momentum and preserve positivity of the distribution function. And it's hard for the meshes um, generally to handle several characteristic speeds. So you have waves that are really fast and waves that are really slow, and they're interacting together at all times. Um, and that's pretty hard to, to figure out. 
Um, so we thought about just doing, what about physics informed neural networks? Can we use that um, instead of meshes to, to um, solve this? And we thought that this was a good idea because the initial approach is basically like, let's give it a shot, right? Let's try this like new, new, new way of modeling things and see how far we get. And I think it's important to highlight, and I wonder what Chris Rakak has to say about it. So I think this is sort of one of those good use cases for physics informed neural networks. I think they are overused, but in a case where something is high dimensional and our numeric models are not very good and surrogate models are quite attractive, um, then using um, physics informed neural networks could um, make sense. So as many of you might know, uh, NeuroPD is the package in SciML that takes care of, of solving, of, of, you know, is the solver package for neural networks in the SciML ecosystem. So I turned my attention to it um, to try to build on top of it um, and to build plasma models on top of it. Um, but there were a few problems at the time. So for one, um, the, the Vlasov equation is a heterogeneous integral differential equation with indefinite integrals. And at the time, NeuroPD did not support um, integral differential equations, nor did it support heterogeneous systems, nor, nor did it support indefinite integrals. And I still wanted to do this. So what I did is I actually just went into the code and started to like um, uh, contribute to it. Um, I mentioned this fairly um, j just because I think it's a good model to contribute to SciML this way, like trying to expand the scope of what it can do and thus like doing cool things with it. Um, and it was a lot of fun. So I you know, encourage everyone to do the same, but that's enough talking. Um, how about we talk, we go through a code example and uh, we, we just walk through it line, line by line, but I'll just basically describe it first that um, pl plasma is basically uh, an array of distribution functions and species. So you, you give it, um, you give a plasma, you describe a plasma by saying, Hey, I want this plasma to be electrostatic or collisionless. And then you, you define it by setting up the distribu initial distribution function and the initial species that species has a mass and a charge. And with that knowledge, we can create a full plasma model that we can then, um, pass to a solver to create a, a simulation. So the first line here, we just call plasma and all its contents. Um, the second and third line there, we just define the temperature that's going to be used to define the Maxwellian um, uh, distribution of, uh, of the, the plasma that we're trying to model. And then in line four and five, we define species. These are predefined species that are already um, in plasma JL. So this is a deuterium ion and the other one is an electron. Um, then the lines underneath that, we then set, set a distribution object based on the Maxwellian initial distribution and the species D and the same analogously to E. What we're doing here, this Maxwellian distribution is already predefined in plasma.jl, but you can also create your own um, uh, distribution functions. We don't need to think about the geometry right now, but basically what we get at the end is that we get to define a plasma as an electrostatic plasma that takes these distributions and the geometry. And th this, this object can then be passed to the solver that can then take in any kind of, of you know, can do any kind of dimensional um, sol solve with any strategy available in your PDE, any number of layers and of newer networks. And that's all sort of like abstracted away. So you can, you can configure it if you want to, but we, we have like, reasonable and sane defaults to make it even easier to model plasmas. So let's see what this um, looks like, this example. This is a pretty boring example because it's, uh, it's a plasma in equilibrium. You, you barely see any difference um, as, as the code sort of progresses. But um, the good news, and this is not dis displayed here, is that this preserves momentum and, 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 and energy which is like a good sign of a model that is working in the plasma world. So, um, yeah.
moving along to another example, which is a little bit more um, complex, is the two-stream instability, which is a common benchmark in plasma physics between codes. Like we, we check how accurate they are, how fast they are, and so on. Um, and uh, we'll just walk through this once again, line by line. So once again, we call plasma, and then we define the species, um, electrons. And now we're going to create our own um, initial distribution function called two stream here. And each distribution function in plasma JL um, returns a, a function that has that needs to have two arguments, one x and one v, for the position and the velocity of the particles. Those can be scalars or, or vectors. And basically, we create the initial condition of two stream instability. We pass that function or we call that function here in the distribution and we, we create an object here um, de with the, the electron species so the distribution of e we call geometry let's ignore that that for now and then we um, once again call an electrostatic plasma and then we solve it with a slightly different time span slightly different time domain and space domain um, which seems pretty clear. Let me know if you have questions there later. But um, this is a more interesting example, as you can see here. Let's see if we get this to run. OK, so here we start to see some more interesting behavior, but also some more problematic behavior. For one, um, there's an interesting thing here is that the neural network is capturing the behavior, but it's not capturing the initial condition very well. And you can see that slightly small here, but that the loss struggles to converge and it's basically dominated by the initial condition of the distribution function f. So that means that, um, and you can see that in the, uh, in the simulation as well, that this takes a while for it to st stabilize and form this, this like stream. Um, and these are th this is a problem that can be mitigated now that we have domain decomposition and adaptive loss, particularly adaptive loss in um, neuro PDE, thanks to Zoe McCarthy's um, pull request that was merged a couple of weeks ago. So this is definitely something that needs to be improved upon um, in the future. So let's talk about the features of the Plasma JL interface. I touched on this briefly, but basically the goal is to model any number, uh, any any plasma, so easily, right? So that means that we need to model any number of species, any number of dimensions with any training method, with any distribution and either electrostatic plasmas or collisionless plasmas, just like super easily. So we built the interface so that you can um, create a plasma object that takes uh, an array of distribution functions and each distribution function has uh, an initial distribution and a species. And uh, you can pass that to a solver, which returns a plasma solution, which is an object hold, holding like all elements that you need to like um, analyze the solution that you got. And you can sort of see us, you know, you can sort of play around with us a little bit in the sense that you can create your own species or use a pre-made one, create several types of initial distributions as you can see here with the hot carrier example, which is a different um, plasma benchmark. Um, and then you can always uh, set a plasma to be collisionless or electrostatic, and then solve it in one to three dimensions, which is actually three to six dimensions plus time. Um, yeah, so just in conclusion, uh, I know I talked fast, sorry about that. Um, what was done is that we attempted to solve the Vlasov Maxwell and Vlasov Poisson um, systems with physics informed neural networks. We built support for indefinite integral differential equations and heterogeneous systems in neural PDE. We created a solver for plasmas based on neural PDE. And we open so sourced Plasma JL as an interface to easily model these plasmas with physics informed neural networks. And the future goals. Um, and basically our road to V1 is to add GPU support. These are pretty heavy models and I've been running them in Julia Hub and like the cheapest um, CPU, which is not ideal. And this needs to be fixed upstream, um, probably in the near PDE level. Um, we want to add decomposed do uh, domain decomposition for um, in to increase accuracy and to increase um, the conservation of mass and momentum and um, uh, energy. 
um, in some of these models that, that I ran, um, conservation um, started to wane as the model advanced um, with time. And with the domain decomposition, we think this is going to be well mitigated. Um, we also want to use adaptive loss for some, some models that are harder to, um, th th you know, that struggle to converge, like the one I, I, I showed earlier. We want to create a makey recipe for better graphing. Right now, this is a problem with Neuro PDE as well, and we need to get a little bit better at graphing. I think this needs to be solved a little bit further upstream. And then we want to add support for our surrogate models in an interface, um, which is already possible in your PDE, and then also add batteries included um, validation. Um, so basically, I can ask, hey, Plasma JL, how well is my how good is my model? And it can just show me the conservation laws and how well they're being um, maintained in the, in, the, in the simulation. So I can basically know how much I should rely on um, the model that I'm looking at. Um, thank you. Um, you can reach out on Discord or by email or check out my GitHub. And I'm happy to answer questions now. Thanks, Gabriel. That's very nice. Um, I uh, I'm just picking up some questions from YouTube and Discord. Um, so the first question is: uh, What does your plot show for the two stream instability? How does this compare to a, a kinetic or pick model? Oh yeah, so basically that one is, I'm basically, I, I get the question because I zoomed in into one stream over there. So basically you, you could zoom out and then there are two streams down there. I just wanted to show the weird behavior that you saw on, on, the, on that one stream on top. But basically it's the same, it, it's, it plots F versus V um, in zero to four domain. Um, and that's like, different from a particle and cell model because you're not actually moving a particle. You're just seeing the solution to the Vlasov equation in that time um, and space domain. All right, um, next question. Uh, how does your model handle kinetic effects like Landau dapping? Um, well, the Vlasov equation generally um, neglects some, some um, Landau damping, um, if I recall correctly, definitely some scattering is neglected there. Um, basically, it's it models every it's supposed to model everything the Vlasov equation models, and it's supposed to neglect everything that Vlasov equation neglects, right? So it's basically just plugging in the Vlasov equation and to a physics informed neural network and seeing what it does. All right. Um, next uh, is the number of particles in each species defined by the distributions you mentioned. Is that a limit? Um, and as a follow up. Is that also is that also a way to add boundary conditions or ex, uh, or external fields? Um, can you repeat the first question? Uh, the first question is uh, is the number of particles in each species. I, I I assume that this question is specific to a slide. Um, yeah, yeah. Is it defined um, by any distributions that you mentioned, uh, or is that a limit? Yeah. So so this is a little different. So this is a particle and cell uh, method that has like a number of particles and. And what we're doing here is, is really just solving mathemat like approximating the Vlasov equation with a neural network. So it's a bit, it's, it's something a bit different. All right. Um, I, okay. So last question, um, last question. So how, how can you do hybrid models with plasma.gl? That would be, that would be the ideal thing, I think. So I'm using that to develop surrogate models would be would be great so because we you have this thing in plasma physics called um dryer kinetic uh models which are pretty accurate but super expensive um and doing that with like a hybrid model with that and plasma jl will probably be probably be the way to go um uh, long term for like high accuracy it is not something that's been implemented yet and so yeah all right. Um, I think we can do one last one. Like, did you did you happen to comment on boundary conditions? Um, you know, or oh yeah, you can, you can yeah. implement your own boundary conditions as well. So okay. that, and that, that and will then, just go into the pin. You know. Yeah. The, so you can also pick them like um, to be Dirichlet or um, Neumann as well, or you know, for for the distribution function, they can be reflective or not, um, or periodic. Um, that's all implemented in the interface. 
All right. Uh, you you have more questions, I think, in on YouTube as well as um, as well as Discord. So do uh, do check both those out. Um, okay. And uh, thanks again, Gabriel. I'm just going to move on to the the next speaker real quick. Thank you. Um, next we have Avik, uh, who's um, I Avik. Your your screen is. Your screen is a bit, I you know, ah, this now now it's now it's better. I was confused as to what was happening there. Um, all right, I, I will quickly introduce Avik Pal uh, from the Julia Lab at MIT, who's going to talk about mixing implicit and explicit deep learning with skip DEQs and infinite time neural ODs. Yeah. So hey everyone, I'm Avik, and I'm going to be talking about uh, mixing implicit and explicit deep learning with skip decks. So this is a work done at Julie Lab in collaboration with Alan Littleman and Chris. Uh, so we'll directly get into uh, what deep equilibrium networks are. So they're essentially a class of implicit neural networks, which are used to model infinitely deep neural networks. So what that means, essentially, we have an explicit neural network, let's say f of theta. And we just want to apply the same function over the input x an infinite number of times. So it's essentially an infinite composition. Uh, but that raises two questions. How would we actually backpropagate through an infinite composition? And how do we reasonably store those intermediate solutions because there are potentially an infinite number of them? Uh, so what happens when you actually iteratively evaluate the same function over, over, over and over again? So there can, there can be many possibilities, but let's say three of the most common ones the first one would be it, it, the solution just diverges. One case could be the solution keeps on oscillating between multiple values. And the third one could be that it reaches a steady state or an equilibrium. Uh, this, uh, this third case is what we are mostly concerned about because that would mean that if we evaluate a function uh, for n times uh, and we reach a constant value, we do not really need to evaluate the function till infinity. We have already reached a steady state solution, and it doesn't really matter how many times we evaluate it next. So this is where the deep equilibrium model comes in. So instead of just uh, defining a new, new explicit model, we are just saying that the output of this uh, equilibrium model must be the steady solution of the steady state equation, f of the uh, with an initial condition zero and parameters theta. Uh, now, do you, because of implicit function theorem, what we can do is if we differentiate the function, it turns out that we, in the backward pass, we just have to solve a linear equation. So we do not really need to solve, like store any of the intermediate values. This is good because uh, if you see the equation, it just means that we need one VJP, which uh, we, which we get from the reverse mode auto diff. So packages like zygote or reverse diff would give us that, and we can solve the linear equation using any neutral Krylov method, which is really fast. And again, like we do not really need to store any of the intermediate com computations. Uh, now that we know what deep equilibrium models are, uh, like why are we actually interested in studying these models? First thing is that the back propagation doesn't really rely on intermediate gradients. Uh, so which means that these models are really memory efficient. Like you can have a thousand iterations or a hundred iterations, the memory cost for the backward pass is constant. Second, you can have you are able to model dynamical systems more accurately. So you can impose stronger inductive biases into those models. And in a lot of cases, that would actually accelerate. Uh, your learning because you have stronger priors. The last and um, uh, the case that we are mostly interested in is that these models can automatically adapt their depth to the input. So for explicit models, you have a fixed model and given any input of any complexity, you have, the, you have to do the same computation. But let's say you have two cases where one is a simpler input and one is a more complex input. You want to have more depth for the more complex input and have shallower depth for the easier one. So a deep equilibrium network or even neural ODEs would automatically adapt its depth based on what the input is. 
However, like uh, as we saw for the equilibrium network, in the forward pass, you have to stop solve a steady state equation, which is not very cheap. So how do we accelerate that? And that is the question that motivates us to develop this new framework called Skiptex. So the, like we have a very simple intuition. The initial condition that we give to the solver is not very good. It's just zero, which doesn't really make sense. Can we make, have a better guess? So what we do is we have a small explicit model, let's call it GFI, and we tell the network to guess a good initial uh, condition for our steady state solver. So if the model is able to predict the initial condition that's really close to the actual uh, steady state, we'll have to perform less iterations. So the idea is that over time, like as we are training the model and we are doing it end to end, so we are jointly learning theta and phi, the model would learn to predict the steady state solution or at least get so close to it that we have to perform very uh, few iterations. So we can think of it like a predictor corrector approach. So the neural network G of phi is the predictor and then the steady state solver is just performing a, a set of corrections. Uh, but now we have introduced a couple, like a few problems. Like, do we now we have to we have more hyperparameters in the form of GFI, which is not ideal. In our experiments, we just found that if we set GFI to be f of theta, same as f of theta, uh, it just works for all the problems. And as far as how do we train it, we have the we just minimize the L to norm between the initial between the guessed initial condition and the final solution from the steady state solver and that and that's the essentially auxiliary loss term and we can end to end back propagate through this uh, we also explore another idea so as you can saw that introducing gfi added some extra parameters and like since our entire pitch is around like we have low uh, low memory requirements it's uh, not ideal to have extra parameters so can we actually get rid of that it turns out if we, instead of using G of uh, phi, if we minimize, so if we perform one iteration of f of theta, and we say that the first iteration needs to be as close to the steady state sub solution. So what this does would be, this would incentivize the model to learn a simpler dynamics. And turns out in most cases, even this outperforms the skip text, and we just call it skip tech version two. Uh, now I'll just uh, introduce the package that we have been working on for this. So we call it FastTech, and it's uh, publicly available on GitHub. So what do you do uh, to define a deep equilibrium network? You just pass an initial model, and you just say what solver you're going to use. For now, uh, let's call this discrete deck solvers. I'll discuss what they are in the later slide. To define a skip deck, you would just have to pass an additional function, which is essentially modeling G of phi. Similarly, for the regularized DEX or skip deck v2, you just uh, don't pass GFI. So, like with a simple API, you can actually perform all these kinds of different uh, deep equilibrium networks, and uh, it already implements all the linear solving in the back end and everything. Now, coming to infinite time neural ODEs, or as you call it, continuous DEX. So the models that we saw in the previous slides uh, were modeling discrete dynamical system, but discrete, like discrete dynamical system come with its own set of problems. So consider a linear dynamical system uh, with u naught equals to one. We know that it will converge to a steady state of zero if, al if the norm of alpha is less than one. But if you see that if you set alpha to zero point nine, you will see that every step is like it's just slowly slowly going to con converge and so in most real world applications we uh, evaluating the function would be very expensive so we do not want to make a lot of evaluations similarly if alpha is minus 0 0.9 it just this value just ping pongs over the steady state so like we consider these shortcomings of dynamical like discrete dynamical systems and what we could do is rewrite the deck as a continuous dynamical system. So instead of uh, finding a steady state for f of theta z minus z, uh, we are taking that quantity and saying that this is the rate of change of z. 
Uh, for people who are familiar with near ODEs, the right hand side, like if the right, entire right hand side would be modeled by, let's say, G of theta, that would exactly resemble a neural ODE. Uh, and now we are solving this uh, uh, infinite time neural ODE with the initial condition C naught, Z naught, and we are solving it till time t equals to infinity. For a neural ODE, we would uh, stop at a lesser time, let's say at t equals to one or two or something like that. Also note that this formulation just works out of the box with skip text because we would just have to change the initial condition and we have made no assumption on what the initial condition is for modeling it as a continuous dynamical system. Again, like we uh, provide out of the box support for continuous text and fast text. So this was the example from the previous slide. Uh, so we have a discrete text solver. So instead of just passing a discrete text solver, you could just pass a continuous text solver and pass your favorite ODE solver. So here we are using TZ5. Uh, and in most of the other ODE solvers would just work out of the box. You could even use a fixed time step solver uh, and it should just work. Now uh, coming to a few results. Uh, so what we see is that our models do indeed converge much faster to the steady state. So here is a toy problem. We are just fitting uh, multiple points to a polynomial. Uh, if you look at the leftmost, you would see that the uh, solution actually wiggles a lot before it actually converges to the red line, which is the ground truth. Uh, skip deck also like doesn't wiggle that much, but also takes some time to reach the solution. Whereas skip type we do or regularized text uh, reach the steady state really fast and they do not actually pickle. Uh, coming to more realistic cases, we uh, if we run it on MNIST, turns out we have like two x faster training and six x faster predictions. Uh, so our model is actually able to uh, circumvent a lot of problems with implicit models, which involve like uh, dramatically slower training and very slow prediction. So uh, we get closer to explicit, explicit models. We are not uh, completely there yet, but this is definitely a progress in the, same, in the correct direction. Now coming to continuous step models, uh, for Cypher 10, we saw that if we use uh, just the vanilla deck uh, uh, with like even continuous and discrete, like none of them actually converge to a steady state. This doesn't affect training per se, however, uh, the yeah. Uh, however, if we go for continuous uh, skip decks, we do see that the models are actually able to converge within a reasonable depth. So for these models, we had like a threshold of a maximum of twenty five layers deep for convergence, and within that, only the continuous regularized models could uh, converge. Finally, this is uh, some of the plot. So as you can see, uh, we like most of the models have re like the similar accuracy, even though the continuous skip models are converge faster uh, to the steady state, which also means that during prediction and training, they are trained faster. And uh, thank you, that's all. All right, uh, thanks, Avik. Um, I have one question from Discord. So um, what are some good applications? Oops, did I? Yeah, there you are. Um, your uh, screen is not on the stream, though. Ah, there it is. Um, so what are some good applications of D DEQs in general? Uh, what types of problems would be good candidates for, for DEQs? Uh, so right now, I, I would say uh, we can use any of these implicit models for uh, in place of, let's say, any standard explicit model, say image classification, segmentation. Like uh, a lot of papers have shown that we uh, these models are competitive with uh, standard like ResNets and everything for Im like ImageNet and Coco and all those data sets. Uh, some other applications would be if you're trying to uh, fit a system and you know that it, like and you know certain parameters of it. So any dynamical system you could. Uh, try fitting those in as well. So basically anything is, so right now we are just constrained uh, with the uh, uh, training time and like a lot of papers are currently working on the same direction. 
Uh, also, uh, if you consider ro robust models, so there have been certain papers showing that these models might be slightly more robust to adversarial examples than explicit models. All right. I, um, I'm just uh, looking for more questions from the Slack and, and YouTube. But in the meantime, I, I had a question. Um, I mean, you were talking about dynamical systems, and then you, and then you showed us this MNIST example, mm -hmm. and and in my mind, I couldn't quite compute the connection between image classification and dynamical systems. So, uh, mm -hmm. could you comment a bit on that? Sure. Yeah. So I, I would think of uh, like DEQs as like a general framework for like just doing a mapping, right? So you have a, a like n-dimensional real plane to an n-dimensional real plane. You're just performing a mapping. Uh, so yes, that the uh, we are so this mapping is being performed by a dynamical system, but the input can really be anything. And so and because we were targeting like a more machine learning, uh, like traditional deep learning space, it made sense that we have like an image classification problem where the input is like an n-dimensional input would be the image. And we are just transforming that image into some latent uh, space and then just applying some form of like classification head over that. I see does that, that clarify. Yeah, that, that does. Thank you. Um, let me let me check the uh, let me check the other platforms. Um, have you uh, have you tried have you tried it on dynamical systems then and uh, you know have uh, what sort of uh, benchmarks and results do you see? Uh, we haven't tried directly these models on dynamical systems. However, like we are uh, using, like we are, we have been developing models inspired by uh, this idea of like better initial guesses for stiff uh, systems. And I, I can say that we are getting at least like around seven to eight X performance gains there. Like, even if we include training times and everything. I see. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's, I, I know we, we have like three to four more minutes. I think we, uh, we don't have any further questions in the chat. So what I will do is I will take this time to thank you and uh, transition to the next set of speakers and, um, and get that all set up for them. All right. Thanks again, Avik. All right. Hey, Theo and Zach, welcome. Hello. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, Zach, could you could you test your audio again? I'm not sure I heard you well. Hi. Could you hear me? Yeah. Now, now I can hear you. Okay. okay. So, um, do you, so do you guys want to both share your screens, and I can put whoever's screen on? Uh, sure. Great. Yeah, Zach's going to be sharing first. Okay. All right. Full screen. Try full screen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, we have another three minutes. So, um, you know, you can start then. Theo, when will, will you be speaking over Zach's slides or do you, do you have a separate screen to share that I should switch to? Um, I will be speaking first for the first two and then um, I will uh, have a separate screen share the uh, second half of the talk. Okay. Would you would you mind testing that screen share as well? Because we have the time. Yes. Let me do it. Oh, looks like I have to quit Google Chrome and reopen it real quick. So, could we start early then? He's back. Okay. Does the work? Yeah. Um, yes, Zach, you could continue sharing your screen. I okay. and uh, yeah. So um, what what would happen is you know whenever. Um, Whenever this, you know, I I can just switch to Theo's screen. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you, yeah, you could just keep. So you're your first. Screen. Yeah. I'm just gonna I'm gonna put your slides on. 
And since we are one minute, I'm just going to start introducing uh, both of you, and um, and then you can take it away. All right. Um, all right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, and um, welcome back. We are with uh, Theo Diamandis and uh, Zach Frangella, um, who will be talking to us about uh, speeding up a backslash b with uh, randomized preconditionals.gl. Um, uh, whenever you guys are ready, you guys can. Uh, and take it off. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. And thanks so much for organizing uh, organizing the first SciMLCon. So hi, everyone. My name's Theo. I'm a PhD student at MIT in the Julia Lab. I'm working with Zach, who's a PhD student at Cornell. And we're going to talk to you all about how to speed up linear system solves with randomized preconditioners.jl. So next slide. So essentially, we're going to show you this uh, you know, one easy trick that your professors are not going to tell you about to get a very uh, easy 5 to 10x speed up on iterative solves of linear systems. Um, and we're going to do this by constructing a very particular preconditioner, which is actually going to go through how to uh, do this next. Hi, everyone. I'm going to give you an overview of our preconditioning technique, uh, randomized Nystrom preconditioning, which was a joint work with Joel Tropp at Caltech and my advisor, Madeline Udell. So our setting for today is uh, we want to solve uh, large symmetric positive definite linear systems, possibly with uh, regularization. And uh, by large, we mean a direct solve is not computationally feasible. Uh, the ideas can be extended to other systems, such as symmetric systems, but we're mainly going to focus on the SPD case today. So the standard uh, large scale uh, solver for symmetric positive definite matrices is the conjugate gradient method. Uh, it's very scalable because it only requires matrix vector products. And uh, we know CG converges quickly when the condition number of A is small or equivalently the eigenvalues are clustered. Unfortunately, a lot of times in practice, this isn't the case. So that could make CG quite slow. But to give a nice visualization here, uh, on the left, we have a figure that shows spectrum that are easy for CG, like the ideal case here, first figure on the left, the spectrum is completely flat and the uh, condition number is one. Whereas on the right here, we have spectrum that are quite hard for CG. Like this first one, uh, both these figures on the right, the spec, the condition number is quite large. Um, especially in particular, this one on the right, you see the spectrum a lot in machine learning applications. So uh, if you notice, if you could just kind of flatten the top spectrum here, you could get a very uh, well-conditioned system and CG would be fast. And the, the preconditioner we're gonna talk about today does this. So what is a preconditioner? So preconditioner is something that, you know, has basically has to satisfy two properties. Uh, you can easily apply its inverse and, you know, it makes results in a nice spectrum where the uh, preconditioned matrix well conditioned. If you get that, you know, CG will be very uh, fast to converge. So like what our approach is, is that uh, we're basically find like the best possible preconditioner uh, for a certain class, but instead of doing it, uh, forming it exactly, which would be quite slow, we approximate it in a fast and efficient manner. So the ideal preconditioner uh, for our type of problem would be uh, if you wanted to just flatten the top spectrum, the ideal thing would be to find where, you know, uh, the rank K, but you need to go to the flatten the spectrum sufficiently, and you would form this preconditioner here, P. Um, so P uh, is a very easy to invert uh, and cheap to apply. So to invert it, you would just flip this uh, ratio here and uh, you would just replace lambda K plus mu I by lambda K plus mu I inverse. And what this does is this flattens the spectrum associated with the dominant uh, K eigenspace of the matrix. So it flattens all those guys to lambda K plus one plus mu. So as a result, uh, the preconditioned system, the condition number reduces from lambda 1 plus mu to over lambda n plus mu to lambda k plus 1 plus mu over lambda n plus mu. So this is a very uh, significant reduction when the spectrum decays. So that's uh, very helpful. Unfortunately, that's not very practical because computing a partial exact eigen decomposition is expensive. So instead, we do it approximately using what's known as a Nystrom sketch. So it's kind of the, by definition, it's given by this expression here, which is a little bit unintuitive at this point, but uh, we'll give an explanation for where it comes from. Uh, so we do not compute this though, using this like naive expression here, because with the pseudo inverse, because that'd be numerically unstable. 
Our procedure instead uh, returns the Nystrom approximation as an approximate eigen decomposition, V hat, lambda hat, V hat transposed. Um, and here, omega is just a random test matrix. Uh, the common choice to use is a standard normal Gaussian matrix. And where does this come from? So it turns out uh, the Nystrom approximation, although it has a kind of funny expression, solves this very intuitive approximation problem, uh, optimization problem. All we're doing is we're just finding the best approximation to A and the column space uh, of A omega. So that's where this comes from. And so just to give you a little bit of theory for why this works. So the Nystrom approximation uh, does very well, gives you a very good uh, rank R approximation whenever the uh, spectrum decays quite quickly. This is an older bound from like Trop et al. 2017. If you want to see a more refined bound for the approximation error, you could check out uh, Frangella, Trop Udell, 2021. And, you know, in the case of regularized systems, uh, we've showed that, you know, under the right conditions for constructing the preconditioner, the condition number is uh, less than 28 in expectation. So you get a very well-conditioned linear system. So that's kind of the theory behind it and the idea. Now I'm going to turn it over to Theo for the uh, details on the implementation. Can we go ahead and switch the screen share? All right, great. Um, so the uh, implementation of this is going to be in randomized preconditioners.jl. Um, and you can construct the Nystrom sketch with only two lines of code. Um, so one line of code to construct the sketch and then another line of code um, to build the preconditioner. And sometimes uh, you may want to get uh, P inverse as well. And so this can be done super easily with um, a Nystrom preconditioner inverse. So these preconditioners in particular have very efficient methods um, for solvers. Uh, so we use multiple dispatch to implement efficient left divides and multiplies. Um, and so this is done because we store a factored sketch of the preconditioner. Um, and then you can essentially just use one keyword argument to pass these to your favorite iterative solvers. Uh, so for example, krylov.jl is going to use P inverse and iterative solvers.jl is going to use P. Um, so all you have to do is set the preconditioner keyword argument in each of these. So we talked primarily about the Nystrom sketch here. Um, however, uh, if you're moving beyond positive semi-definite matrices, we include a few other sketches in randomized preconditioners.jl. In particular, um, for symmetric matrices, there's the Eigen sketch. Um, and you can do most of the same things with the Eigen sketch as you can with the Nystrom sketch. However, if you're uh, looking at general matrices, um, we also have the randomized SVD. And so one additional keyword argument here is this Q, um, which is essentially a powering parameter, um, which uh, does a type of Krylov method to uh, have a more accurate sketch. So these sketches also come with um, several utilities, uh, one of which is fast multiplication, essentially leveraging the fact that they're stored as their factored forms. Um, and then uh, some tools for adaptive sketch size selection. So one parameter that you saw show up through this presentation um, was this R parameter, which is the size of the sketch. Um, and a lot of times you don't know this a priori. Uh, you would only actually know it exactly if you could compute the full eigen decomposition. And the whole point of these methods is that you don't do that. Um, but you can use these adaptive techniques where you say double the sketch size parameter until your estimate of um, the norm of the sketch um, minus the original matrix is small. And so a few examples of this. Uh, here's one of ridge regression um, with, a, uh, with about 4,000 features, and this is a data set from OpenML. The eigenvalues of the matrix that's constructed are on the left. Um, you can see that essentially the rank of the matrix is approximately 2,000. And then you can also see mu, which is going to be the parameter of ridge regression, uh, which we choose as 1e negative 4. On the right is the convergence of conjugate gradient uh, with several sketch size selections. Um, so several sketch size selections are. And one thing in particular that I want to point out is essentially whatever parameter you choose, you always get a speed up here. And these uh, sketches are really fast to construct. So it almost never hurts you to do something like this. Um, however, you can see that even if we choose a relatively modest sketch size, so for instance, R equals 100, we get about a 3x speed up, despite the fact that the true rank here is about 2,000, so it's much uh, greater than 100. And then actually, as you go to a sketch that approximates the rank, 
So once we get to R equals 2000, uh, we get convergence um, to, uh, we get convergence here in um, nine iterations. So it can get really, really fast as you actually approach the rank. And then back to the example that I showed at the beginning of this presentation, um, here is ridge regression with 15,000 features. Um, and this is solved with the Nystrom preconditioner in under five seconds on a laptop. The um, preconditioner itself takes about two seconds to construct. So you're getting a total system solve of about six seconds with the Nystrom preconditioner versus about 25 seconds with no preconditioner. In addition, um, this is a case where the diagonal preconditioner works quite well. However, a lot of times the diagonal preconditioner doesn't work particularly well. Um, however, the Nystrom preconditioner can usually uh, almost always get you some type of speed up. So again, it almost never hurts. So uh, to go from here, um, I encourage you to check out randomizedpreconditioners.jl, which has uh, these methods, um, and that's on GitHub right now. It's being added to the Julia registry in a few days. Uh, also, this does work with linearsolve.jl, which is the SciML linear solve interface. So again, just with two lines of code, you can construct your preconditioner and then um, just put it in whatever uh, solver you call from linearsolve.jl. In addition, uh, check out Zach's paper on Nystrom um, preconditioned conjugate gradient method. And then for more kind of in the randomized numerical linear algebra um, world, you can check out this Martinson and Trop survey, uh, which is recent and quite good. So to conclude and just highlight a few future directions that we're thinking about, um, with this package in particular, one of the things that we would like to do is add additional test matrices. So right now we're using that standard Gaussian normal test matrix that Zach mentioned. And uh, this is great for dense systems. However, for sparse systems, it a lot of times destroys the sparsity pattern. However, there are some other um, test matrices that are more specifically tailored for sparse systems. And so we hope to add those to the package pretty soon. Um, on the more research side of things, general preconditioners for non-symmetric systems is pretty much an open research question. So if this is something that's interested to you, uh, interesting to you or would be useful to you or you'd like to collaborate on this, please reach out to us. And then, of course, uh, we would like to um, improve performance and robustness a bit of this package and then also uh, work on applications. So both Zach and I come from the optimization community and um, being able to solve linear systems fast is kind of a core primitive that is in a lot of optimization algorithms. And so uh, finally, here are the references uh, that were cited in this talk. And then um, thanks for your time. If you want to contact us, here are both of our emails. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Zach and Theo. This is actually pretty exciting work. Um, so there's, there's one big question in the chat is, uh, you know, uh, does this work with sparse matrices? You, you said there's limited support and that you need better support. So uh, what's missing? Yeah, I guess so. It, it works. Um, it's just right now, kind of when you take that sketch of the sparse sparse matrix, um, you're taking the sketch with something that's totally dense, so it kind of destroys the sparsity pattern. Um, that might, depending on the application and depending on your sketch size, that might be totally fine and it might not matter. Um, however, sometimes, of course, like you would want to retain as much of that sparse structure as possible. Um, and so for that, like I said, we're trying to add some other test matrices that allow you to kind of pick from a, a library of test matrices, um, whatever the best one for your application might be. And so that's trading off things like accuracy uh, versus sparsity, preservation, and so on, computational time, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, we there's, uh, there's another question from YouTube. Does uh, can it take a, a random number generator state, you know, just setting a random number generator state to make this entire thing reproducible? Oh, uh, yeah, that, there's no reason uh, why it couldn't. OK. Um, so um, even even with the um, so even with your sketching, right, you don't you maybe you don't even need to preserve sparsity in a sense, right, you just need um, you just need a, a sparse matrix that's that's sort of easy to invert according to your according to your sketching standard, right? And it just needs to perhaps have the same sparsity level, um, or or even if it doesn't, it 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 yeah maybe maybe just the space same sparsity level given given the the memory requirements of the problem at hand, uh, generally speaking. So um, so so yeah, do you have any comments on uh, comments on that? You don't need to, I guess, you don't need to uh, the fact that you don't need to preserve sparsity. 
or, or I don't know, maybe, maybe that's what you meant by preserve sparsity. Zach, do you want to take that one? Or do you uh, want to sure, take? sure. I didn't know. Like, uh, so I guess uh, our current precondition, the one we've talked about, right? Um, because you're taking the eigen decomposition, ultimately you're going to get something that uh, an, a, a partial eigen decomposition, you know, we output it as U and like lambda hat. So that U matrix is dense. So it's N by R. So, you know, if that's not ideal, you might want to do something different, but there's ways of modifying the construction where like, you know, you could keep the thing to be uh, sparse, but we didn't really focus on that. Uh, some of the matrices we were looking at uh, when we were initially working on this project was uh, were dense uh, matrices for machine learning, like kernel matrices or data matrices that arise in ridge regression. So that was our focus, but there's some different things you could do probably to better optimize for sparsity. Okay, that's the that that's cool. Um... Uh, could you uh, could you recap which uh, preconditioners you've benchmarked this against? Uh, um, I, I saw a little chart there. Um, uh, so, like, uh, if you look at the uh, the if you look at the paper, we compare it to other randomized preconditioners. So, like, there's a for least squares problem. A common one is uh, Rockland and Tigert. Uh, we also compare it to a, another method of uh, known as an adaptive iterative Hessian sketch. And uh, for uh, kernel matrices, we compared to uh, random features preconditioning. Um, but for uh, this presentation, we just compared to uh, we just stuck to diagonal preconditioning here. That's what the that's the Jacobi in the second plot that Theo shared. All right, sounds good. Um, otherwise, uh, well, thank you both for your time. I don't see any further. Well, actually, there is there could be one incoming question uh, on the on the Discord. Um, so I'll just wait for a second for that, um, you know, because you have four minutes. Um, let's see. Don't see any other questions on YouTube. So let's, let's look at Discord. All right, this is taking a while. Um, It's, it's it, the, the the person who has the question uh, said that they were going to take a while to type the question, so um, so yeah, I guess they're they're in a race for time here, but um, but now this 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 is great work. I I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I can't wait uh, to try it out with my with my stuff. You know, sparsity I think would be a big thing for for a lot of people. Um, you know, just just mostly because you know PDEs and all of that. You know. Yes, mm. it's sparse. Yeah, you want to preserve yeah. that structure for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. And we're currently working on applying this in some optimization context, which also a lot of times have, have sparse structure as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. Um, okay, so I'm, okay, so the question hasn't come in yet. So what I will do is uh, I will request both of you to, to get on the Discord and sort of help answer questions there. Um, it was a fascinating work. So, um, so, and I'm sure people are pretty enthusiastic uh, to ask more questions. Um, so I'd request you to check out the Discord. All right, otherwise, I want to thank, thank you both, and I will welcome the next speaker. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, we have two more minutes. Um, we have two more minutes. So, um, you know, uh, one minute. Uh, you know, at four fifty nine, I will introduce you, and um, and we can, um, and then you can you can start at four at at five, uh, sharp. Okay. If that sounds good to you. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, could you could you uh, say something else, please, uh, just to test your audio? I thought it was faint for a sec. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. This this is better. All right. It it was faint faint at the at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, but the, this is, I believe, the uh, final talk for the day. Um, actually, you know what? I may as well uh, announce this. You know, per, this is the final talk of the day. After which, we will send out a Zoom link to the Discord, where uh, you know we can join for like for you know an open format discussion. Um, but but uh, we will end the live stream after this talk. Um, you know, after you know, I guess thanking all the speakers, etc. But um, 
but um, but yeah, we should you should uh, be on the Discord to look out for that Zoom link. Otherwise, um, I will introduce our next and fi our final speaker of the day, um, Kyung Hyun Lee. Um, he's here to talk talk to us about bifurcation based machine learning of dynamical systems. Uh, take it away whenever you're ready, Kyung. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Gyeong, and I'm a PhD student at University of Bristol. And my supervisors are David Barton and Ludovic Ranson. And today I will um, talk about uh, bifurcation-based machine learning of dynamical system, uh, which is um, um, example of applying cyanol packages uh, for system with bifurcations in nonlinear dynamical systems. Um, I will introduce some examples um, from experimental bifurcation analysis uh, to using experimental bifurcation analysis to build the dynamical system models. I'll first show you some example of parameter dependent systems that undergoes bifurcations. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I have problem with I think I have problem with um, videos in this slide. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I see. Did you, you pro did you upload a PDF or a Google slide up here? Uh, I uploaded my slide here. I see. Hmm. Oh yeah, it's um, actually it was shown in uh, my colleagues. Uh, slide in Sandor's slide. You can was, send uh, links to uh, links to it, and I can I, and I can just uh, and I can just send it to the Discord if if that's that's easy. Uh, but 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 you should continue with your talk. Oh yeah, I'll just continue with it. Um, it's um, um, self-excited system example of self-excited systems. Um, like um, in airplanes. At certain speeds, um, there could be some limit cycle oscillations on airplane wings, and it can end up uh, of disasters. So usually researchers doesn't want those kind of problems. And these are the first example that I wanted to show was this, uh, the, it's called air elastic flutter and the wing flaps at certain wind speeds. And the, another example that I wanted to show on this uh, second slide, uh, second video was a wheel shimmy, which, um, which at certain speed of the uh, vehicle with wheels, it can lose like its controllability or manu manu maneuvering ability so it's called as limit cycle oscillations and self-excited systems and this type of dynamic system without an external excitation is often called a self-excited system and it is quite challenging to make a model that can predict this phenomena accurately and i'll show you some example that if we use cyanol packages uh, packages then we can model these systems quite um, interestingly. And self-excited systems are typically modeled with ODEs with Hopf bifurcation. And we can understand Hopf bifurcation geometrically from this figure here. And at certain parameter of value of mu, uh, we call this a uh, control parameter. And there can be change of stability changing of an equilibrium and the branch of um, limit cycle oscillation is generated at this equilibrium and uh, self-excited vibrations that we uh, observe that are shown in the pre uh, previous slides uh, are some stable limit cycles somewhere over um, in the upper branch over here and there are some interesting characteristics of systems with bifurcations that we can use in modeling, which is like um, existence of an invariant manifold, which I will explain from the next slide. 
and invariant manifolds are sub manifold of state space that are preserved under the flow. And this is a very nice figure explaining the invariant manifold of the flows start and flows starting in this manifold stays in this manifold and dynamics on this manifold is called reduced dynamics and many reduced order modeling starts with finding this manifold from the full scale ODs and system with hope bifurcation has a center manifold and for example damped mechanical systems has um, some invariant manifold as well and in this in this case and we can use the uh, existence of the invariant manifold and the dimension of the environment manifold as the domain knowledge of the modeling and this is a general framework of training parameter dependent ode models using machine learning and first we model the parameter dependent vector field using scientific um, models or universal approximators like neural networks or we can use hybrid models and we need to also model the observations uh, for example we can model this as a just simple projection map or also universal approximators and after we make a model structure then we have to transform the parameter identif identification problem to an optimization problem using data fitting criteria such as mean square error and I, i'll explain from the next slide how we infuse the domain knowledge of the invariant manifold and the bifurcation to our machine learning problems yes so um <laughs> basically um i do experiment uh for system with, with bifurcations, uh, which is called experimental bifurcation analysis. This is the um, bifurcation diagram measured from a, a flutter rig experiment, uh, which is a typical subcritical half bifurcation measurement. Um, these red circles are the um, measured unstable periodic solutions, um, which are stabilized using feedback controllers and these blue uh, blue circles are the um, measured stable limit cycle oscillations so if we draw this uh, a bif bifurcation diagram then we can um, plot this like uh, this typical subcritical half bifurcation diagram and and this, we know the bifurcation structure of this um, this uh, measured system, on, which is a dyna reduced dynamic on the invariant manifold. And the in interesting thing of nonlinear dynamical systems are we can use coordinate transformations to transform this this. Uh, dynamic system to a topologically equivalent dynamic systems and we can we we usually use uh, these coordinate transformations to um, derive some simple type of uh, type of uh, ordinary differential equations which is called normal forms and these are the simplest uh, polynomial usually a polynomial type of uh, equations that um, reproduces this dynamics in a uh, simplest form and, and we can use this or those kind of um, differential equations as uh, our basis model and I'll show you how we can train this uh, system using the normal form so uh, I'm sorry about the um, this equations errors. Um, I don't know what happened, but um, anyway, I'll just go on. So, equation I have used to reproduce the dynamics uh, shown in the last slide is using the sub subcritical of normal form, but I added uh, quintic 
terms to reproduce the satellite bifurcations to uh, to make a stable limit cycle oscillations on the in the uh, on the upper branch. So this is the basis model I used to make a topologically equivalent um, dynamic system. And the advantage of using normal form-like equations is that the shape of the trajectory of the LCOs of this system on the normal form coordinates are LCOs, just very simple LCOs with the circle trajectory. And um, if we transform this to a polar coordinates, and it's it shows that the uh, amplitude of the normal forms are just uh, simple fixed points, and the, we can decouple the speed of the oscillations uh, with the amplitude equations. And using this basis model, we can design the bifurcation diagram very easily uh, using um, the, the, these are model parameters, um, A2, to design the um, design the bifurcation diagram and this mu, this mu zero is the Hof bifurcation point and this large omega uh, is to uh, model the speed of the oscillation um, and I use neural network in my um, in my modeling case and <clears throat> this is the summary of training uh, the the um, obser observable, um, which is uh, basically a coordinate transformation between the um, invariant manifold, which is a center manifold in this case, uh, between the invariant manifold and the measured uh, measured trajectory. So basically, uh, this observable, which is a neural network, uh, it's, uh, it's a combination of linear transformation and the neural network uh, transforms the uh, circle, uh, which is the trajectory of the normal form. And this two uh, measured um, some complicated closed form shapes. And so in order to match this uh, Transformed um, trajectory to the uh, to the measured trajectory. I used uh, the metric uh, between the two distinct curves, uh, which I used these um, Fourier coefficients of the closed curve because a closed curve is a two pi periodic uh, function on the polar coordinates. So um, I measured the distance between these two curves, which I have uh, used as a loss function in the optimization pr process. And to summarize the uh, procedure of training the model, uh, I first create the topologically equivalent dynamic system on the normal form coordinates, uh, which is um, just um, arbitrary coordinates. Uh, then train the this arbitrary coordinates between arbitrary coordinates and the measured coordinates, which is um, observable. Then um, train the um, another part of the normal form, which is responsible for the speed of the oscillation, which is um, this omega function here. And this is um the experiment I, I did in the wind tunnel this is the uh, flutter rig and um this this system oscillates at certain wind speeds and i measured this uh flutter phenomena with this kind of rig and stabilized the um uh, unstable periodic solutions using this shaker with a feedback control. So <clears throat> this is the measured uh, bifurcation diagram. Uh, these are the measured uh, bifurcation uh, lim limit cycle oscillations, um, stable limit cycles in the upper branch and the unstable limit cycles in the in this lower branch. And 
uh, we can see that the um, bifurcation diagram is quite accurately predicted and also um, we can predict the um, phase trajectory of the uh, limit cycle oscillations. And so I also train the speed of the oscillations um, using the optimization, um, which I used um, loss function to minimize the uh, mean square error using DFEQ flux.jl. So um, you, you can see that um, the speed of the oscillations are uh, very accurately, pre uh, accurately trained uh, on the stable branch and as well as on stable branch. Um, the trick of a little trick to train on stable branch was if, uh, because of the uh, unstable unstable predict solutions for half bifurcation is unstable direction of the this um, periodic solution is on the radius direction uh, and uh, the re radius of the uh, the amplitude of the oscillation is the fixed point uh, so i only uh the the time integration in the tangential direction so which is uh trivial flip with corresponds to a trivial flock flock multiplier so i didn't have any problem with the um stability issues in this case uh, oh, i need to go fast and i'll show you another example of using invariant manifold and um, this bifurcation theory in training uh, for a system with uh, mechanical system with uh, harmonically forced systems. This type of uh, a system has also invariant manifold, which we can uh, understand as a nonlinear version of modal subspaces. So um, like this forced systems uh, also have bifurcation diagrams, uh, which, which is uh, called frequency response functions. And if we fix this uh, force amplitude, then we can have one of the um, this frequency responses plotted here. And so this system is actually a two-parameter bifurcation problem with um, which uh, like three parameters are forcing amplitude and the forcing frequency. And this red curve in the middle is called the backbone curve, which characterizes the nonlinear um, resonances. So this equation here is a normal form of forced mechanical system in polar coordinates. Uh, this row is uh, amplitude of the vibration. And this, uh, this psi here is the, um, um, is the phase difference between the force and the response. And if we measure the uh, phase of the response and as well as the uh, phase of the force, then we can train um, this normal form using the input output map generated from uh, this, uh, this equation here. And in this case, the steady state responses have um, very nice input output uh, map relations. In this case, um, um, rather than using numerical integration in uh, training the machine learning model, I used uh, kernel rich regression, with, uh, uh, which I used kernel functions.jl and optim.jl to um, optimize the hyperparameters here. So from the bifurcation diagram, I have trained the, this machine learned model to predict uh, the steady state response of the system with the invariant manifold. And this is the um, experimental example here, uh, which I, uh, which is just called a uh, nonlinear electromagnetic system. And I excited uh, the, the base structure here uh, using the shaker 
Oh no! I, actually, I didn't excited. Um, my colleague excited this, and uh, I used the uh, data of this measure, uh, this experiment to build a model. And this is uh, this 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 these uh, curves are bifurcation diagram uh, with fixing forcing frequency and varying uh, forcing amplitude. These these curves are called S curves here, and this blue blue dots here are used to train the model. Uh, no green dots here. Uh, these these green dots here are the training data sets. And using the normal form model, I trained the machine learning model. And you can see here that um, this uh, these blue blue circles here are the untrained me uh, measurements. And you can see that. Um, the model can predict the untrained bifurcation diagrams quite accurately. And from the backbone curve here, uh, measured backbone curve here, um, uh, we can see that the machine learning model can extrapolate as well as the interpolate um, here. Yeah, um, yeah I used um, Jul Julia Sayama packages to build a parameter dependent on the models from data. And what machine learning modeling approach developed here uses uh, invariant manifold and bifurcation structure as a domain knowledge. And for the future work, uh, I want I'm I'm trying to identify by invariant manifold from delay embedding maps and discover um, here. I only discovered the tangential. Uh, dynamics of the invariant manifold, but I want to discover the trans transverse dynamics of the invariant manifold, which I can build a much um, much general dynamical system model. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. all. Sorry, um, sorry, I had to cut you off. This point this is a great talk. It really, I really enjoyed uh, you know looking at all the experiments that you generated data from. Um, but uh, I, uh, we do have to move on to the last item of the day, um, um, and I'll have to give a few announcements. So I want to thank the speaker once again, um, and then make a few uh, announcements. Thanks, Kyung. Yeah, thank you. So um, thank you for uh, bearing with us or uh, being with us until the end of SciMalCon. Um, we have one last item for the day, which is an open discussion. The open discussion will be on Zoom, and we are pasting a Zoom link as of right now into the Discord. Right. So if you if you'd like to join this open discussion, please do join the Zoom link on the Discord. Otherwise, um, you know, Chris, unless you have any anything further to say, I I just want to thank all the speakers and uh, and and the keynote speaker. Let me add you to the stream. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I just want to say, yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, you know, this was a this ended up being a great conference. Um, we saw a whole lot of variety, a whole lot of applications, a whole lot of new methods. Um, and so, I, I think that um, you know, I, I I think that this shows that we should be doing this again. Um, when, when we came into this, we didn't know, you know, will we have enough applications? Like, is our is our community large enough? Um, we have seen that we we've gotten to the level of of being able to to pull off a conference, and that's uh, really exciting. Um, there are a long ways that we have to go. We're still a fairly um, small community, and you know, we're still a fairly small community, and um, you know, there's a lot that we should be doing, right, to, to be able to grow this community um, and, 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 you know, increase in, in many different ways, you know, in terms of contributors and users and, and everything. Um, and so we'll be launching a bunch of summer programs in order to continue growing uh, th th this community. And um, I hope to see you and chat with you about all sorts of things, you know, technical and also just community related in this um in, in this in this uh discourse so you know if, if you want to chat uh please join the the discord um you will you know you'll see our chats and then you can join our zoom our, our zoom call and we'll be talking in breakout rooms for the rest of the day so thank you very much everyone thank you everyone i'm ending the live stream now